Thanks for joining us for another For Investors by Investors Long Beach podcast. As always, we're proud to be your all education real estate resource without any kind of sales pitch. If you'd like to attend one of our meetings in person, we meet on the last Thursday of the month at the Grand in Long Beach, California. You can RSVP on forinvestorsbyinvestors.com forward slash Long Beach. To find more investment resources such as blogs and podcasts and content from other Phoebe groups, you can go to forinvestorsbyinvestors.com and search our entire library. Now, on to the podcast. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know, uh, Phoebe stands for For Investors by Investors. It's not a knockoff from FUBU. So, and uh, it was actually put together by a couple of full-time real estate investors that were tired of getting the sales pitch every time, the boot camps. The book of tape sets, you know, the upsells at the end of the night, all that kind of stuff. At any of our different clubs throughout Southern California, you won't get pitched anything at our clubs. It'll be strictly education, networking. You know, it was actually put together because the 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 uh, the founders, Jeremy and Ellis, which Dave and I are now partners of Phoebe. Um, we're tired of getting that boot camp and book and tape set because you can't really rely on what the speakers are saying. It's really hard because they're trying to sell you something at the end of the night. And so we found that just by coming out and helping each other and trying to develop, trying to basically provide as much education as we can based on what we know and the relationships that we know about, we find ways of working with everybody else in the room in different ways and, and find, find ways of, of making money together. And that's really what this is about. We can't really make money in real estate without each other. You, you, it's a very big relationship business, and so it's important to actually understand that. And I can tell you, when I just when I first got started, when I started networking and going to these different educational uh, events, my business exploded. I was going to four a month, raising capital and doing different for a month, for a week, and raising capital and doing different different activities to develop my relationship base. And over time, it developed into a situation where there's plentiful resources everywhere now. You know, and and. You know, capital is easy to raise now. You know, deals are easy to find now, and it's it's easier. very easier. Yes, yeah. in this market, easier to find with relationships, <laughs> especially if you're dealing with the California uh, California market specifically. So, um, that being said, we have a number of different chapters throughout Southern California. Um, we have one up in Pasadena, one in Orange County. Dave and I uh, run the Manhattan Beach Group as well, and so um, our Manhattan Beach Group is more of a panel type discussion. Uh, Dave and I tonight are going to be doing more of like a roundtable Q&A type discussion. So uh, we want to uh, bring it to you in a way where we, we combine our combined knowledge, we have a ton of different uh, skill sets when it comes to real estate from self-directed IRA investing, from flipping properties either uh, on, a, on a, a scalable, consistent approach or on a very high-end approach. Uh, we, we do a ton of different things together. Dave invests in non-performing notes. I invest in more performing type notes and a little bit on the non-performing side. Um, uh, we, we both run real estate businesses as well and know quite a bit about the different, uh, about the game really, about how this whole thing works and the relationship that, that it, it takes to get, get this thing moving. So um, we want to kind of get an idea from you guys as far as what you want to learn, what you guys want to talk about, what your resources what that you need are, what things you guys are struggling with, and have it be more of a Q&A type, type thing. So what I'd like to do first is I'm going to hand it over to Dave to give uh, an overview about his experience because I think he has a ton to add in this uh, as far as real estate investing goes and his knowledge base doing this for, what, how long now? 40 years, 50 years, 60 years? <laughs> is that what it is? So. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'll let you get a few rips in. Go ahead. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so Matt and I love to, to just kind of rib each other, so just expect that all night. This will be part of it. By the way, if you can't see Matt, he's the white guy. I know it's hard to see you against this wall right here sometimes. Um, so, yeah, so I, I've been in real estate full-time for about 10 years. I've been an investor for about 15. I've you know, bought a couple of properties just to start off and got into it 10, you know, 10 years ago full speed. In the last 10 years, you know, and, and part of what Matt and I were trying to figure out a format for this that would feel functional and feel informative, one of the things that we talked about is that you know, he and I have been, of that 10 years that I've been investing somehow, some way, probably nine of them, you know, Matt, Matt and I have done something together in some, some form or fashion. Clearly, we run a real estate investment club together, which, you know, that, that's the, as Matt was talking about, generating leads, and no matter what you're looking to do as an investor, you know, lead generation is like the number one thing. Because if you don't have leads, 
you don't have money, you don't have property, like whatever it is you're looking for, you need leads that you can you can talk to. And this is one way that Matt and I generate leads is through you know running through Phoebe. We're part of other uh, real estate investment uh, or, or other type of networking groups as well. Um, you know, I do run a non-performing note fund. I've also invested in a lot of notes. Some of them notes that Matt puts on his properties. You know, he, Matt runs a, a pretty sophisticated operation out in Memphis and does everything from debt to equity to joint venture partnerships and all different kinds of things. And, and I've participated uh, with those uh, in those deals with Matt. Um, I also have clients that want to invest, and maybe they don't want to invest with me, but they're looking to invest in out of state rental property, or maybe they're looking to invest in other things. So I also spend time connecting other people to other uh, investors that have real estate opportunities, and there's ways you can monetize that time as well. Um, uh, we, we've, uh, we definitely spend time um, raising capital. Like That's a hard part of what we do all the time, and there's different structures for raising capital. You can raise it through a syndication. You can raise it through individual partnerships. You can, you know, you can raise it through joint ventures. So you guys may have questions on raising capital and how to structure and what, what your options are. So I think what we kind of want to do is, is get a sense of, you know, around the room, some of the things that we've kind of talked about, like what are the things that you guys are most curious to hear? Because we could talk about all kinds of things, but we also don't want it to be such a scatter shot that like we don't really, we just cover a bunch of stuff, you know, real high level. Um, so I think what we can do is we can we can go around the room. Normally what I do here is we'll go around the room just in 10 seconds. I'd love everybody here to say, you know, who you are, what you do, and what you're looking to learn and what you're looking to accomplish here. So, uh, and, and uh, please keep in mind, this is a key, this is a key thing. Every, pay attention to the different people that you want to meet at the end of this room that have the resources that you don't have. Like that, that is very, very key. And it will, it will boost your business to the next level. Yeah, show of hands. Who here has a deal and you're looking for money? Raise your hand. Who here has money and you're looking for a deal? Okay, so that right there, right? Like that, if you get nothing else out of Phoebe, there's two guys here that would love to meet the six of you. Make sure after this meeting you spend some time networking. But you know, even here, whatever you're, as Matt's talking about, tell us what it is that you're looking for, because that's the power of Phoebe. Is you know, you're looking for this. He has that. Well, after the meeting, talk to him and figure out if there's a fit there. So. Yeah. Cool. Sorry, I'm gonna put you on the spot. So, <laughs> <Thanks. just laughs> so yeah, who you are, what uh, what you're looking for, and um, and you know what you do. Well, and, what and, and, and what tonight you're you're most curious about? Yeah. To hear about. It. My name's Kathy Villa Gomez. Nice to meet you all. Um, I am looking for a triplex, duplex, or fourplex for cash flow. And I've been out of the real estate investing. I have attended many meetings, learned a lot, has spoken to Matt on many occasions, been very helpful to me to in deciding, uh, helping me to to make some informative decisions. Um, so I'm, tonight I'm hoping to just make up my mind, California or out of state. Okay, it's a good topic we can talk about. Yeah. Thomas? Oh, so hello everybody, my name is Thomas. Um, so I'm actually, I have a construction business um, and we're just trying to kind of understand how we can better help and assist you guys figure out ways to more efficiently invest your money maybe into you know flips or, or different type of properties we can free up some cash flows to kind of give you guys a little bit more, more money to play with. Um, on top of that, you know, I'm just a person that likes to add value wherever I can. So I, I may not be the most you know efficient guy when it comes to real estate, but I'm here to add value wherever I can. I work hard for you guys and you know I, I expect that to be reciprocated the same. One of the hardest team members to find is a, a, a good contractor. So I would urge everybody in here to get his card at some point. And I don't even know you, but I'm just saying, like, in reality, that's a hard team member to come up with that, that knows what they're doing. So I don't know if you know what you're doing yet, but you might. So everybody should figure that out, right? He's smart enough to come to a Phoebe meeting. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. So, so. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Luda, and I'm a real estate investor. I have several properties here in, uh, around the LA area and in Central Valley, around Modesto. Um, at this time, I'm looking uh, to buy preferably single family or duplex uh, to fix and uh, rent out. So it's, I'm kind of like long term um, passive income person. So, okay, cool. Uh, cash flow. 
And if the price is right, um, I'm, I would be willing to buy, but basically it's a fixer upper for long term rental. Cool. Mm -hmm. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Fabian Silvis. I work for a company called Sound Equity. I'm a hard money lender. Um, we uh, probably 8% of our business is fix and flip uh, lending. Uh, I also offer intern products. Uh, I do some industrial, some commercial, some construction. Um, but I came out here today to uh, see if I could meet any investors that were looking for an additional funding source. Um, and thanks for having me out. And, and I have to say, he is a private money lender, not a hard money lender. Yeah, right, so right. hard money makes it hard to make a profit. He yeah. actually was talking about his rates earlier. They're not too bad. So, question here. Uh, I'm Roger Solera, and um, I'm, uh, I have a rental here in Long Beach, as well as uh, other parts of the state. And uh, just got out of a course uh, for wholesaling and flipping. And uh, I tried to do Texas, but uh, I think I'm going to rain in the state of California. So yeah. I'm looking for your money. Yeah. <laughs> Texas has <That's> some <laughs> Hey, everyone. My name's Kyle. I uh, work in finance. And uh, just really interested to know more about uh, multifamily value add opportunities and kind of strategies, tactics, or what's going on in the Long Beach area. Hello, my name is Aritza. I am investing from South Georgia, Iowa. It's education, so I'm interested in education. And I'm also interested to find out if um, in rehabbing, you can't really, it's a business, so you can't, um, you can't uh, invest, you can't do the business from South Georgia, Iowa. So I guess what I would like to know is, if you form an LLC, is that, uh, if you form an LLC with a couple of other people, well, is that separate enough that you can still fund it from your self-directed IRA without it being a business and it being a passive investment if it goes through an LLC? I guess that's my, okay. that's my biggest concern right now, is trying to figure out how to rehab without, with my self-directed IRA. So okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, First time here, um, trying to absorb just pretty much information and everyone's backgrounds. I'm really interested in investments, uh, venture investing, REITs. So if there's topics about that, I'd like to learn more about it. Cool. Bill? Bill Hart. I'm a sponsor. Uh, Hart Kate is my law firm. I uh, specialize in real estate transactions, real estate litigation, and construction litigation. Um, done work with Matt uh, for some time. and. Uh, Proud to be here, proud to be a supporter of uh, Phoebe, and uh, uh, I'm here usually every month and uh, spoken a couple of times, so feel free to ask me. Uh, get free legal advice. For what Bill, Bill has uh, really helped me substantially with different contracts and, and cleaning up different items for my company and things like that, which have been absolutely great on the, you know, uh, on the legal side to get the right advice from an attorney that knows what they're doing. So I think that's extremely important. There's a lot of bad attorneys out there, let me tell you, and, and Bill's not one of them. So um, it's been uh, it's been refreshing to have a, a good attorney on board. So thanks, Bill. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jeff Dixon with Udirect IRA Services. We're a self-directed IRA company. Most everything that gets talked about in meetings like this, you can invest with an IRA into. I'm happy to help you out with questions on that. One specific thing, we also offer a solo K, which is a 401k plan for self-employed people with no full-time employees. The only reason I mention it specifically is if you are, if that would be a good option for you, you have to have the account open before the end of the year to make a 2017 contribution. And as it can take three to four weeks to get it created, you really need to start pretty darn quick if you're going to have a good shot at getting it done by the end of the year. Um, Happy to help you on questions about that too. What's uh, and and Udirect is also a sponsor, and they they fund extremely quickly on their stuff, and they their administrative function is absolutely awesome, which is very rare to find in some of the some of the bigger IRA uh, custodians. And um, he's absolutely right with a self directed four hundred one k. It's amazing what you can do. I mean, you can go through and put your not just your eighteen five 
personal contribution, but a 25% matching for your payroll. So if you pay yourself $100,000, you can go match it with $25,000 more into your 401k. So it could be a pretty big income shift right inside of a 401k. So if you're having a tax problem at the end of the year, it's something to definitely focus on for someone that with no full-time employees um, for a solo 401k plan. So... Hi, I'm Tiffany. I am a public interest attorney, so this is totally separate from what I normally do. Cool. <laughs> but I'm really here just to get, I think, information and decide which direction I want to head in. Everything sounds, not everything sounds interesting, but I'm trying to figure out, I guess, where my lane will be and mm-hmm. whether I want to look into staying in California um, or looking into the resources in other, well, I guess, in other specific states. So I'm just kind of open and trying to absorb as much information as I can. Okay, thanks for coming. I'm Kim. I'm also a public interest attorney. Um, Let me I, guess. You guys know each other? No, not at all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, here to observe and learn. Um, just getting into learning about different investments. Um, yeah, that's where I'm at. Taking control of your financial future by understanding these investments is yeah. key, for sure. Hi, uh, my name is Omar Perez. I'm a real estate fi- fix and flip investor uh, slash realtor as well. Um, what I'm here for, I've been doing this for about eight years now, so I'm looking for capital, either equity, partner, uh, to do to the multiple deals that I have currently in the contract. So, yeah. Thanks for coming, Omar. Hi, uh, my name is Felix. I uh, run a small hedge fund in Las Vegas. I'm just here to... Uh, um, and enjoy the show. Cool. I've been here for the last three years now, so it's the first time. Nice. Thanks for coming. Hi, my name is Albert Avina. I'm a sales manager at Cerritos Nissan, and I just want to make more money. <laughs> You're in the right place, man, I'm telling you. So. Yeah, well, I see a lot, of, I'll mention it to Bill, I see a lot of credit applications a day, right? About 50 approximately. And I see the winners and I see the losers, right? And the winners are all. You, you wouldn't have been saying that after 2008, so in 2007. But <laughs> nowadays, maybe. But yeah, yeah, but you know, no one was buying a car in 2008. Yeah, that's true. So that's you, true. you would have saw any applications. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, my name is Tim Beardsley. I'm a realtor. Uh, I'm mostly in South Bay and uh, a little north of South Bay. And uh, I've been a long time uh, joiner here. And I, I, it's always interesting. I always, I always learn something. I always meet people. That are interesting, and I'm sitting right up right now on two flip uh, listings. So, uh, one in Torrance, uh, single family, and one in Westchester, which is a duplex. It can actually be developed today. So, uh, <laughs> see, there we go. Already, <laughs> already working. It's that easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, interesting. I was learning stuff here. It's always kind of cool. Thanks for coming, man. But I do like the more in Manhattan. Yeah, 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 you can understand. <laughs> hey guys, my name is Yuki. I'm with Active Pest Control out of Norwalk. Um, we have a lot of our customers out here in Long Beach, though. We do all of LA County, all of Orange County. Right now, we're trying to grow our termite business. Um, so we do free inspections. If you have any properties that want an inspection, um, I would be happy to connect. Um, and uh, basically, also, we have. Uh, Preventative treatments, if you want to protect your property long term. Tenting gets expensive if you're doing it every four, five, six years. Um, but we have like a pore care treatment where you apply it directly to the wood, it soaks into the wood, and it makes the uh, wood inedible to termites for 10 plus years. So you don't have to worry about tenting for a very long time. Um, if you guys are interested, please contact me. We also do rodents. If you have a problem property with gophers or with rats or with uh, whatever, um, we always say, give us your worst property, we'll flip it around, and we'll win, win the rest of your business. So, cool. uh, please give me a, a call. Thanks, man. Thanks. Look, let me guess, you're looking to buy single family and multifamily? Um, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Chaz Wright. I'm with uh, Sellers Advantage. I'm an acquisitions manager. Um, we just want to bring in as many deals as we can. Uh, we used to be a one trick pony. Spend a lot of money on marketing. We call in, we buy your house cash, type of commercials, and we're getting a lot of deals that way. But we leave a lot of deals, let a lot of deals slip through the cracks. Um, we like to connect to people that we make them an offer on the phone. 
it doesn't work, you may want to replace it traditionally. We like to refer that work out to people that know certain areas, so we like to scratch people's bags. But essentially, we want more deals. We close in seven days, type of thing, cash, group of funds. Um, sky's the limit on the deals we can do. Just numbers make sense, it makes sense for us. So, we'd love to, to connect with all of you guys and see if you guys like to the deals. Cool, thanks, man. Hey, I'm Zach from New Western. We're also a sponsor here, and we have provide and sell inventory for uh, local flippers. Um, to, most of the time, they're single family. Um, a few some here in uh, a little bit in the South Bay, a lot in the city of Los Angeles, uh, a lot out in the IE. Um, so, uh, and what I, I buy homes from them, so I'm always looking for deals. Um, so, if you have deals, I will be, I will find you. And when he says a lot, he means a lot. Yeah. They do a lot of activity. We're probably one of the most active wholesale brokers, so at least that I've seen. Right? Yeah. Um, but I'm more here to hear what you guys think about uh, where the market's going, because it's, cool. it's only going one way now. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> cool. Sam? Hello. I'm Sam Hill, also from Western. And um, we, like I said, we're an acquisitions firm and we specialize in single-family residential. We love working with the investors in the area because we like uh, seeing people get what they're looking for from their investments because we have such a great team comprised of really heavy hitters that I think bring a lot of great things to the table for everybody who comes in and works with us. That's why we're expanding so fast. It's amazing. The, um, the primary thing we're here for is obviously to be all of you. I've enjoyed meeting a lot of you already, and I look forward to working with you guys in the near future, assuming that we are all looking for the same thing, which is success. Amen. And Sam uh, promised he's going to do a presentation for us on Bitcoin, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, hey, 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 I'm throwing you out there on the, under the bus right now. So. <laughs> Sam, the more the merrier. Get him going now, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's still good. So. Okay, I, Matt and I, just, for anyone who doesn't... Okay, Matt, Rick? I had to throw it out, I had to throw it out there. Thanks, <laughs> buddy. Okay, so for... For anyone who doesn't know what Bitcoin is, it's cryptocurrency, it's becoming the new trend, and it's moving at an incredible pace right now, in which people who are investing in are seeing incredible returns in the last two months. We've seen it go up over 700%. There are different strategies which you can use to go ahead and invest in Bitcoin, but the worst thing you can do is invest and not know what you're investing in. So it's good to have a base knowledge, at least in reference to the way things work, because like the stock market, like trading, like autos, like, the market, like any market, fundamentals are essential. So I'm going to try to give you guys the fundamental tools to have a good base on your pyramid so that you guys will be able to understand what you're doing and you choose to answer that. What about Ethereum? Huh? What about Ethereum? Yeah, Ethereum, altcoin, Litecoin, uh, Zcoin, I mean, I mean, still, you have to have the same, you have to have a good base in reference to the understanding of what you're doing. I mean, they're, yeah. cryptocurrency is cryptocurrency, but they're, they're all operating under different Hi, sir. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thanks, buddy. Didn't mean to open a can of worms. So. <laughs> and, how are you guys doing? I'm Isaac. Um, I'm actually in this real estate game. Um, I was just wondering, you know, if, what are the first few steps to take uh, into becoming an investor? Uh, okay. I'm in, I work in the construction field. I'm actually in Blazer, and so I'm one of the high rise buildings in downtown LA. And um, yeah, I was just here to check it out, see what everybody has to say. Thanks. Cool. Thanks for coming, man. Hi, I'm Jeff. Uh, I'm actually in this right now on my first duplex, and I'm hoping to Ooh. add to it, maybe make it some triplex or expand one of the units. Um, so just trying to learn as much as I can and cool. hopefully increase the value of that and move forward with another property. Awesome. It's a good strategy right now is adding that square footage, so it's how you get those deals. Uh, my name is Adolfo. I'm a new builder. Uh, I'm just trying to get uh, the information from you guys. My first time here. Cool. Thanks for coming, man. Thank you. My name is Danny. I'm a, I'm a builder of the High Desert. Uh, I've been building since 2000, more or less. Uh, and I'm just trying to learn new things. Uh, I'm here kind of just to, to expand my knowledge, pick you guys' brain, and see see what avenue I want to take after this council. So, awesome. But, that's where I'm at. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for coming. Oh, uh, so Valdo Martinez. I'm in the family business, uh, developing construction. My first time here, so just trying to learn new things, different, different paths to take. 
Okay. Cool. My name is Dolph Martin. Uh, we're developers in High Desert, and um, we're wanting to get out of, well, not necessarily get out of, but expand from you know, ground build up to maybe picking and dipping and buying an old in it. Just want to learn different creative uh, financing that uh, we've been learning about making. Okay. How to structure these things, how to raise the capital for them, and exactly. stuff like that. We're trying to take advantage of different options to where we can use other people's money and, and grow our business and acquire more property. Cool. Mm -hmm. You're in the right place, man. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for uh, Robert Martinez, thank you for the uh, first time here. Just trying to see where I want to go, learn something new. Thanks to the family for coming. We really yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> it's awesome. I, I wish I could get my, my family here. So. <laughs> it's awesome, man. My, my brother is my business partner, too. And when, when we took a hit when the market crashed, we were button heads a little bit. But that's what brothers do, you know? So. <laughs> Wait, wasn't your mom like your bookkeeper, too? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, she, 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 she did a little bit of bookkeeping. But, but we, after a while, we're like, yeah. We, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not saying you didn't fire her, but I'm just saying she helped out, right? <laughs> No, I did not oh. fire my mom. <laughs> no, even worse, she quit. Yeah, she quit. Yeah, so, like, you're not fast enough, mom. We're tired of teaching you how to work a computer right now. So, <laughs> so. Uh, man. Uh, Joseph Polanco. I work for my commercial investment and uh, realty out of uh, downtown Los Angeles. Uh, we do everything from, you know, new places all the way up to your uh, shopping centers. Um, so, any type of uh, work here, obviously, find you guys is next and best investment. For sure. Cool. Yep, I'm Francis Gillespie. I'm also a commercial uh, real estate broker with Remax Commercial downtown LA. I'm looking to offload some deals. Uh, I currently have an eight unit in Koreatown. Rents have not been increased since 1980. Uh, significant deferred maintenance, I think it's a great deal. Uh, we, spe we specifically target uh, multifamily, from triplex, duplex, uh, 80 unit buildings, 100 unit, you name it. Um, specifically, if you guys are looking for a great deal, foreclosure is definitely the way to go. I'm talking to this gentleman here, we have a triplex right now. Mike just wants to get rid of it. Um, if anything, uh, I think for the triplex, duplexes are good for us. Uh, retail shopping centers, you know, anywhere from smaller 1 million to 30, 50 million, uh, depending what you guys want to do. Um, but I think for the smaller investors, for a lot of you guys, we do have some good foreclosure properties off market. Um, definitely, we'd love to share that. We just, you know, have to do the, you know, the right thing and make sure we paper up and we put, you know, you know the, the right uh, disclosures in place so we're not just giving people's information out. But definitely, if you guys are looking for a good deal, I do have some. Let's just uh, talk after this or however this works. Anyways, I see you. And uh, when you're dealing with the multifamilies in California, especially when you do a rehab where you can increase the, the rents, you get the biggest bang for your buck when you're dealing with a low cap rate market like California where, you know, that incremental dollar increase in rents adds substantial value to that to that property. So being able to take something like that down, add the value by increasing rents and renovate through renovation can be a, a great game plan, especially if it's not since I heard in 1980, I was like, where's your card right now? Yeah. So, <laughs> so. Stack. Go. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yes, yeah, so we, we, we currently have a $1.9 and $2 million offer on the table. Brokers like CBRE, Market Simple Chap, they do a lot of fluff, smoke and mirrors. They say it's worth 2.7. Seller will take 2.3. And she will take that before going to market. Interesting. Awesome. Yeah. My name is Malai. I'm barely starting, so I wanted to see what direction I want to go, as well as um, looking probably towards fix and flips or buying holding short term, long term. Okay. Maybe multifamily as well. Cool. Thanks for coming. My name is Greg. Um, I'm based up in uh, Hollywood. I'm a wholesaler. Um, the, the main area that I farm is the San Fernando Valley. So if uh, there are people here, the people that I'd like to connect with are uh, people that are hard money lenders, uh, title, people that do title, escrow, um, real estate agents, just looking to expand my network. So um, if you fall into one of those categories, you know, meet me later, Greg Douglas, one more time. And as far as what I'm looking to learn, I just kind of want to learn from some other people that are investors in terms of how they're structuring their deals. So cool. Thanks. My name is Dennis. Uh, brand new. Uh, this is my second PB here at this location. So thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, uh, starting out in wholesale. Hint, 
and hands. <laughs> so I'm here to just absorb as much as I can. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Molly. Uh, I am a residential realtor. I've been a realtor for four years, and my brother and I, Jonathan, are new to wholesaling. And so we're really here to learn and absorb knowledge and network with anyone who can help us out. Hi, I'm Jonathan. With uh, with the corner people over here that you guys really can't see, <laughs> just like just like my sister said, we're new to wholesaling. Uh, so I think this is probably the fourth Phoebe event that we've been to. Um, within the past month and a half. So we're here just for the continued education to really learn as much as possible, uh, but more importantly, to meet all of you guys and hopefully you know, deliver something on your guys' aspect and in reciprocation, maybe get something back. So that'd be awesome. Dave, you want to just touch on your primary businesses? Yeah, first of all, great list, guys. I, I think it's, yeah. it's probably more than we can cover, but um, what I'll do, we'll do some introductions, and then I'll kind of yeah. go back and talk about what I, what I feel is consensus here. So, yeah, so I'm also a residential realtor. I'm based in the South Bay. Uh, we deal with a lot of distressed properties, uh, mostly divorce, probate, um, uh, elderly people that are looking to downsize, quarter homes, things like that. Um, and, and part of what we'll do is we'll, we'll sometimes bring in the capital necessary to fix them up before we sell them. So that's part of our pitch when we're working with clients. Uh, I do run a non-performing note fund, um, which basically we buy non-performing second trust deeds and we flip the note. So we, we deal with a lot of debt and, and repositioning debt. And I was talking about repositioning commercial. We reposition debt and then resell it. Um, I run another fund with a high net wealth individual who really wants to invest in real estate but doesn't want to spend the time doing this, right? So we basically have a joint venture arrangement with her where she supplies all the money, we make the decisions, and we split the profit, um, you know, in, in that kind of entity. Uh, I've done some really super high end fixing and flipping up on the Hollywood Hills, although I'm not doing that right now because it feels very risky to do that kind of <laughs> investing right now. But we're eager for the downturn to start getting into that again. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, again, like Matt and I talked about, you know, both he and I are serial networkers, right? I spend a lot of time networking and meeting people and, you know, credit to all of you, even those of you that are getting started, you know, honestly, all of this doesn't become possible if you don't start meeting people. You can't be successful sitting in your home on Google to do this. You've got to get out, meet people. You've got to, you know, you've got to see property. Real estate's a very physical, tactile type of uh, industry and business. Um, and you know, one of the one of the biggest lessons that I've learned in real estate since I've been an investor is that the quality of person that you invest with matters way more than the quality of the deal you invest in. Right. So you can find a really good deal, but if there's bad people associated with it, it could go off the rails quick. Right. Versus you might be in a bad deal, but if you're dealing with good people, chances are there'll be a way that you can somehow solve some of those problems. So uh, I think that's something that, that we'll probably talk about as well. Um, do you want to introduce yourself or do you want me to yeah. go through this? Um, well, you mentioned, you missed one other thing, which Dave actually specializes in, uh, uh, has a great knowledge base in self-directed retirement accounts and things like that as well, which I think is really important to So understand. we'll definitely talk about so, your question. Yeah. And then, you know, like Jeff mentioned, you've got another professional in the room that... that right knows more than I do as well. But we'll, we'll touch on it here and then give you some resources on people that you might want to talk to and answer any of the questions you have. Right. And then we also, um, we, we, I'm just to give you a background on myself, I'm a CPA. Um, I quit my CPA from a job a little over 10 years ago. Um, we flip about 10 houses a month out of state. Um, we do a lot of value add multifamily properties. We, we flipped over 600 single family homes now, but we do a lot of multifamily value adds. Uh, we invest in uh, some non-performing paper as well. I create a lot of paper. I do uh, some private private lending. I also raise capital for different syndications and also have a short-term rental business too. So um, it's a lot of fun learning all the different strategies that exist inside real estate. And there's there's even more that are coming up that are going to be kind of interesting. Just to kind of give you, you know, our upcoming Manhattan Beach group that's coming up is going to be in January on uh, – cannabis and real estate uh, and some of the new opportunities that are going to be coming in there. And then we're going to be doing one on the technology associated with real estate and so um, and how new technology is coming out to really uh, uh, come out and really compound everybody's growth and help everybody to streamline their businesses. And then uh, one other thing that uh, we have coming up uh, next week 
in this in this room we're doing an all ch- all Phoebe chapter summer ne- or holiday party where um, all of the different Phoebe chapters are coming together. There's no education there at that time. It's all networking with all the same kind of like minded people and things like that. So um, so I think it'd be a really valuable thing if you want to go to meetup.com. You can sign up and, and go to that one too. So um, that being said, let's get started with this. I, I think you had some great topics. Yeah. So, so l- l- let me let me kind of read back. I think we've got about um, nine things here. Everyone's comment kind of finished. Like I think these big buckets. Number one, I like how you said it: finding your lane. Right. That that's a really big part of getting started. Like how do you get started? So I think we can spend some time talking about that. Uh, buying and holding, single family versus multifamily. I think that's a really good topic. Fixing and flipping is one that everyone kind of gets. It's the you know it's the Budweiser of real estate investing, right? <laughs> um, so we can absolutely spend some time talking about that. Um, certainly, self-directed IRAs using retirement accounts. I think we can talk about that. Um, we talked about adding value to properties versus maybe investing in stabilized kind of opportunities, right? So we can talk about that, especially in lieu of where we're at currently in the market. Um, uh, I think that we talked about different types of deal structuring, so like syndications versus REITs versus... Raising capital. Uh, and that. raising capital for those types of things. I think there's some, some area we can cover in that. Um, uh, at which, you know, raising capital, we were actually having a conversation about debt versus equity, Right, like the, you know, every, every deal has a combination of that kind of capital in it, and you know, there are different sources that you get for raising debt versus raising equity. So we can talk about that. Um, commercial buy and holding, right? I think that's an interesting way because commercial functions and operates differently than residential does, um, and you know, so that's something I think it's worth talking about. And then lastly, current market conditions. I think that's a good good way to kind of end it is talking about you know where we see the market going and and maybe how based off of what we're reading in the tea leaves how we're adjusting our businesses. For example, I'm not doing three million dollar fix and flips anymore in the Hollywood <laughs> Hills, right? Really risky play right now, but it may make a lot more sense getting involved in that you know three or four years from now. So. Um, All right, so why don't we do this? Why why don't we start off with, like, we'll kind of pick a topic. Matt and I will give some initial kind of feedback and thoughts on it, and then we'll we'll take a couple of questions. We'll try to spend, like, 10 minutes or so on each of those, and then we'll kind of move on. Does that sound like a good way to to do it? Okay. I like like the the, the getting started and knowing your lane aspect of things because um, when, when when we talk about, you know, what, what's the game plan? What's the whole point of doing all this, right? It's, it's not to go and make $60 million, or, or maybe it is at some point, but at the same time, the whole point of all of this is to invest your money into passive cash flow so that you can retire, right? I mean, that's why you wholesale. That's why you fix and flip. Um, it, it's not that you want to create a job for yourself, but in reality, that's what you do when you start with the wholesaling type business or something along those lines. You're creating a job. But at the same time, you know, you can also create a business out of this as well, which is the game plan. That's the long-term game plan that you want to do. So um, when, when you're actually going through and fixing and flipping or doing wholesaling or investing in multifamilies or, you know, doing your realty business, which can be pretty lucrative here in Southern California, um, you, you, you're doing constant activities all the time. And you want to look at these activities is – how, how do you structure this so that you're not having to do the work all the time? And so look at every piece of your business in that way as best you can. And, and trust me, this is something that I struggle with and everybody, I think every entrepreneur probably struggles with is trying to actually systematize their business and not be the person that's spending 60, 70 hours a week working your butt off to get these things done. I mean, that's really what it takes to be a wholesaler now in this kind of a market. And, and realize too, when you're a wholesaler, you're you're grinding. You're you're hitting pavement hard, and you're you're talking to people in 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 L.A. that that is you're in the hood, going great. You know, uh, I hope I don't get shot here because I'm trying to talk to a homeowner that is in a bad area, and you don't want and you know where your contractors can get jacked. You you have all kinds of issues that come up with that. But when uh, when you're a wholesaler, you're doing a lot of the same activities as a lot of these different strategies, right? You you typically have to have the capital sources available to actually take. Take these things down. You have to be able to analyze the deal in detail. You have to be able to analyze the rehab in detail, what the market values are of these deals. You have to know a lot of the same activities um, or know how to do a lot of the same activities with a lot of the different strategies, whether you're fixing and flipping, wholesaling, doing multifamilies, buying and holding. It's all real estate. There's just 
different learning curves with each little strategy. So, and can I, can I, yeah, that? please, please. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. so <laughs> it's always great when Matt invites me to come speak to his group and then he speaks to his group. It's fantastic. Yeah. We talked about this earlier. He's like, am I going to get a word in tonight? And I I'm even like, turned the microphone really, you know, off so. and it still didn't matter. <laughs> so I always say like, when you're looking at getting started, finding your lane, like the number one thing you need to do is know thyself, right? Like you guys might find this really interesting, but everybody here is different. Right? Everyone has a different set of beliefs, a different set of risk tolerance, uh, a different amount of capital you have to invest, a different amount of time you have to invest, and different goals. Some people are looking for cash flow. Some people may be looking to preserve capital. Some people may be looking to uh, eliminate taxes that they pay. To start to find your lane in real estate, the first thing that you have to have is a really clear, solid understanding of who you are and what you're trying to accomplish. Like, what does what does perfection look like to you? And sometimes when you're laying out what that plan looks like, it may not be that you can solve that with one deal, right? Like, there may be a plan or an idea that you're growing into, So, but once you have a clear vision of what the, you know, you, you, you may have heard the saying, like, start with the end in mind. Once you know what the end is, then you start backing into, okay, well, this is where I want to go, what do I need to do first? What's the first step I need to take to get there? But if you don't know where you're going, and more importantly, you don't know what you are willing to accomplish and what you're willing to do and what kind of resources you have, it's really hard to get a sense of, well, where do I start, right? So that's really the first thing that I always tell people that when they're sitting down, they're trying to figure out what they want to do. It's almost sometimes, you know, when I'm in a consulting or advisory role, it's pulling out of them, well, what are you trying to accomplish? Like, wh where is it that you want to go? What does, what does real estate nirvana look like to you? It might be commercial. It might be residential. It might be generating passive income. It may be there are some people out there that are junkies and they need the rush of, of, of flipping and doing some high end stuff. Seem like you've done that before, huh? <laughs> and, well, we, we are doing a, we are doing a panel on marijuana. Yeah, yeah. In the 60s, so let's let's be clear. Um, some people have the idea of giving someone their money is absolutely terrifying to them. There's no way they would ever let someone else have control of their money. Yeah. Some people don't want the responsibility of ever having to make a decision or dealing with tenants. And they, don't, they, they, don't, they will actually want to find someone who they perceive is more knowledgeable than them. So I always thought that even when you're just looking to get started, that's the most important thing that you need to do. If it is wholesaling, if, it, if it's you know, raising capital for someone else's deals, whatever it may be, have a good idea of exactly what you're trying to accomplish and then what resources you have right now. And that's usually where you can find, okay, well, this would be the best first step for me. And, and, and I got everybody's goal in mind right here. Everybody's goal in here, I can almost guarantee it, is you want $50,000 a month in passive cash flow. That's what you want automatically. So if you think that in your head at all times and, and constantly are focused on that, you, you will be able to obtain it. it, it you're going to go through the learning. You're going to go through the wholesaling learning. You're, you have to raise, you know, in, in this business, it's not about one specific strategy. It's about utilizing that strategy to gain capital. And, you know, if you're wholesaling, that's one strategy that's absolutely awesome that can make you a lot of money. But what are you going to do with that money? It's about learning the different strategies you can deploy and adding those different tools to your tool belt and doing multiple strategies. Because, you know, you could wholesale your whole life and then end up with nothing at the end if you didn't go through and start investing it in cash flow or something else, you know? So, I mean, and, and cash flow can be completely different. You know, he invests in a lot of non performing notes, but he doesn't have to work out those notes. He's got people that does that for him, you know, uh, and the note business is completely different uh, from a passive cash flow standpoint than, than uh, owning rental property. Rental property, unless you've got a management company that's absolutely great, it's not that passive. It's it, it definitely can be a headache. Who, nobody Even wants if to you deal with have tenants. a property management company yeah, that's great, can be it still may not be passive. Because right. you don't get the first call, but you get the second call. Yeah. Right? Because the property manager then calls you saying, hey, we have a problem. Right. You know, he moved out. This is broken. Like, it's still not. Right. And so, so understanding what your own level is on that side, I think, is, is really important. And what your end goal is and your own mentality. And to me, it's a mix. It's, it's you know, rental income. It's flip income. It's multifamily, you know, big chunks of income from, from that and va adding value there. It's investing in notes. It's investing in syndications and things like that. And but all it's not, of that is key. All of it's key, but it's not all for you. Right. 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 So there, that, that's the big thing is understanding what's the right move for you. And even something that might be right for you right now may be right for you a few years from now. 
but figure out what's right for you right now and then go do that. And then once you have that figured out, and Matt's, you know, Matt's right, getting $50,000 of passive income a month would solve all of our problems, at least financially, <laughs> right? But maybe right now the best you can do is getting $10,000 a month in active income in real estate. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's what your first step is, because maybe that frees you from a corporate job or maybe it frees you from this – then that's your first step. And then once you get that step done, then yeah. you start building on top of that. It's, it's important to definitely look at, look at it from that, that perspective. So you're taking baby steps and learning these different strategies to see what's right for you in the first place, to see what opportunities are even out there that you can invest in and learn about. It starts with the learning aspect, and it starts with you looking at your own financial situation and saying, how much money do I need every single month to retire off of then add more to it to cover with inflation, okay? And, and looking at it from that, that angle, then you can start to go through and say, okay, I've got this strategy over here, and maybe I'll learn about this strategy and see what interests me most and, and what's going to be right for you personally to be able to move forward with. But it starts with your own financial situation. Like if you don't know exactly what you spend your money on every month and you don't have your budget, like it, you know, every single month put together, which I'm probably talking about 90% of you guys in the room, which we all, in reality, we all know how hard it is to keep like every single dollar accounted for, right? I'm a CPA and I have a hard time doing that crap, you know? And so mostly because I don't want to see how much I spent money on, you know? But, but in, you know, when you're looking at that side, how do you know where you want to go unless you don't know what your starting point is now, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I would urge you to live poor in the beginning. Don't go and spend tons of money. Focus on being financially free first because once you're financially free, um, it, it, it's exponential. Like one of our friends, uh, uh, Tuna, lives, li uh, Tuna Hiram, he's an awesome guy, love him, financially free off of real estate. Doesn't make tons and tons of crazy money off of it. But he's completely financially free, and he lives simple. He has a nice car. He does. He does really well right. for himself. He, he like lives and, on a mattress at his mom and dad's. Yeah, house. yeah. I mean, he he doesn't. <laughs> but but he, he doesn't yeah, he care, doesn't. you know. And that's what's yeah. really cool is that he's he has he's obtained financial freedom. I don't care what that looks like. I don't care if it's the fifty thousand dollars a month or if it's the ten thousand dollars a month. That's the key. So, yeah, question. Oh, I was just going to add to that. There's a really good book called Set for Life. Set for Life. Okay. Mm -hmm. That kind of. Speaks to what you're what you're talking about. Live simply, and it's a really. I wish I had read it like twenty something years ago, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> there's there's a lot of those books like that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I wish I'd have read when I was five. You know. <laughs> <laughs> what what I, like? uh, another uh, another strategy that we actually wrote a blog about this. If anyone read the blog that came out a couple days ago through Phoebe, is about when you buy your first home, right? Buy your first investment property at the same time. Right, So there's a strategy right there. Maybe you can afford to buy a house, but you're also thinking about, well, maybe I should buy an investment property. Well, do both. Buy a duplex or a, tri or a triplex. Live in one, rent out the other. Now you've got rental income coming in. You're starting to build that passive stuff that Matt's talking about. And maybe five to seven years from now, you're willing to move out to a house, and now you've got an investment property behind. And, and you, um, learn, you learn about property management at the same time, which I can tell you is a hard business to learn, a very, very hard business to learn. Yeah, you want to talk about a crash course in property management? Have your tenants live upstairs, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Like you'll, you'll learn everything you need to learn about property management. And you may find, like, you know what? I kind of like this. I like, I like the process of helping them and solving them. You may realize if I ever have to deal with another tenant, I'm going to shoot myself in the head. So then when it's time to sell or to move on, you might want to sell the building or you may want to hire a property manager. There's, there's, it's a great way to learn about stuff like that. But, but anyway, what, what, co what questions do you guys have? Yeah. So I actually had a question in regards to that. I have a property in Wyoming right now. Um, it's just a rental property out there. I was in the military a while back, and that was my first investment into real estate, period. Cool. But right now, I'm, I'm using a property manager, and I was you know, just wondering your recommendation for being in California, if I was ever to decide to do a flip or to actually buy and hold, um, would you recommend being a property manager yourself, or do you, you recommend outsourcing that to another company? Here in California? Yes, sir. It depends where, right? Because if it's up in San Francisco, it might as well be in Wyoming, right? Right. So you know, <laughs> right, if, if, right. It's, if it, but even still, it, it, again, it kind of depends on. Well, you know, is, is dealing with tenants something that you have the time for, or do you have the personality for? If you're a very impatient person, I recommend you hire a property manager. Okay. Right? It's also about what's the best use of your time, right? Can you go find a wholesale deal or another rental property in that time while you're hiring enough property manager to do that aspect? And 
Do you know the tenant landlord laws in the state of California? Right, right. He can bite you in the ass if you don't know those laws here, especially here, because you know, it's very landlord friendly or it's tenant good, friendly. It's a good point. We talk about return on investment, right? Like that's everyone knows, okay, I put a dollar in. What kind of return do I get on that investment? What's almost more important is return on investment of your time. Mm -hmm. I put an hour in. What does that hour earn me, right? And if that hour earns me $6, and you could go spend that hour earning fifty dollars someplace else. Then doing property management is a terrible idea, right? But right? for the experience itself, you wouldn't say that that's even really that valuable, to be honest. Well, well it's absolutely valuable, mm -hmm. right? But you don't need to have every skill in real estate exactly. either, right? Yeah. Like you know, maybe your skill is construction, right? That that's where your value is. So you know, Matt talked a little bit upfront about look building a team, right? Like we all only have so many hours in the day. So you can't do everything and build a big business and a big life in real estate by doing everything. Ultimately, you need people and resources. The trick is figuring out, okay, well, where's my lane? What are the things that I like to do the most that I find that I'm good at and that I have um, a passion for? And then all that other stuff is stuff that you can either outsource or hire or, or you know, find other partners that handle some of that, that information. And, and we, we own a, I own a management company out in Tennessee. And the reason I do it and, and the reason – you want to understand property management is one, so you don't get stolen from from property managers. Right. Yeah, Two, you learn to be at a really ridiculously awesome operator if you can go through and efficiently manage a bunch of properties. So having that knowledge base about how to keep your specific rental really efficient from proper property management and proper <laughs> strategy, you know, tenant retention programs and 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 you know keeping that that lease ex escalating in in, in uh, you know your rental amounts. Uh, having your shortened time between between tenants and things like that to keep that efficiency up. All those little things is what you learn from the management aspect. But you can learn that through reading too, and then telling your manager, "Hey, you're doing it wrong," <laughs> you know. And and really, I went through five management companies in the beginning before basically bringing my own on, and then I fired myself and started another one afterwards with the right people in place to help, you know, and, and really it's, it's not easy. And it's when you deal with a hundred people or a hundred tenants or 300 tenants, you're like, I mean, think about your craziest friends and multiply it by 10, you know, I mean, these are the types of tenants you got to deal with sometimes it's, it's craziness, but right. it's also really valuable to learn that, but you can learn it in different ways as well, you know, so. All right, so any other questions on kind of getting started, anything kind of under that area? All right, guys, let's move on. So let, let's, um, let's talk about uh, buying and hold uh, multifamily and single family. Uh, and I, I wrote a note down here because I think people are asking about owning in California versus owning in out-of-state uh, 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 long-term holds, right? And actually, we are just talking about that in Wyoming. Uh, and I'll start off on, on that aspect of it, cool. right? So... Um, when you own out of state, there are some advantages. The number one advantage usually in owning out of state is the properties are less expensive, right? Um, you know, getting uh, one of the properties that's Matt's selling in Memphis, it might be a $170,000 single family house, which might be the equivalent of going and buying a house in Santa Ana or Hawthorne, right? Like a nicer area uh, in a market, but here that same house would cost half a million, maybe $700,000. The problem is when you buy out of state, the, that same property, we look at properties with a, a, a ratio of how much they cost versus how much the rent is per month. So for example, Matt may have a property in Memphis that, that rents for, um, you know, that costs 170000 That property may generate 1500 bucks a month in rent. So it's just under 1% the cost of the property with how much the rent is per month. In California, that property may cost $700,000 and it may rent for $2,500, but that ratio is almost less than half a percent is what that ratio is. So when you buy out of state, generally what you're getting is you're getting a higher cash flow per month based on the dollar that you spend to buy the property. Okay, What you don't get is appreciation, right? Because when you buy in California, you may not be getting as much cash flow but you own that property for 10 years in his market, right? 10 years from now, that $170,000 property might be worth 172. 
I'm joking. We, we, I'm joking. We, we've had the highest appreciation rate in the country you right. know, for or in the Midwest area. Um, right. It was actually a report that just came out, but, but that's because people are chasing cash flow right now. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't know where to put their money, and so they're going for these a lot of these Midwest markets to try to buy these different properties. Oh, which, oh, but but in, all in, joking aside, yeah, yeah, that yeah. house that house may be worth three hundred fifty thousand dollars ten years from now. Right, but, which is a yeah. great percentage. But you only made one hundred twenty-five thousand right, dollars. Right. Versus if you bought a property in California mm-hmm. that's worth seven hundred thousand, yeah. ten years from now it might be worth one point two million. Right. So you don't make as much in cash flow along the way, but when you go to sell it, you're making a huge chunk mm-hmm. of appreciation. Right. So making money in real estate, you know, I always tell people there's four ways you make money in real estate. Right. What are what are the four ways you can make money in real estate? We talked about cash flow. Right. That's one. Selling the property. Appreciation. That's another. Huge tax advantages, that's a third, right? You save a lot of money on taxes. What's the fourth? Leverage. Leverage, right? So when you own property and you have debt, every single month you're making a payment on your debt, you're lowering how much money you own the property, you're gaining more equity every single month. And the way debt works is when you first start off, you pay very little principal down, it's almost all interest. But all of a sudden, come year 10, year 15, you're paying mostly principal and not as much interest, right? So that's one of the advantages of how you make money in real it's estate. It's a long-term wealth-building strategy doing that type of strategy. And, you know, don't limit yourself by your own money in these kind of situations. Like, there's tons of strategies to de- develop cash flow, utilizing other people's money, but using your, um, your skill sets. Just to give you an example, one of the strategies that I deploy with key people that I know well is I will sell them a property at my cost. Uh, they'll put 20% down and get a bank loan. They own the property, but I retain 25% of the cash flow profits and 50% of the equity profits. And I manage it at a cheaper rate and things like that. So I'm, I have tons of these now where I have 50% of a property that's building me long-term wealth over time with none of my own capital in it. Now, you could argue that I had my own capital in it because I gave up some built-in equity to do that. So I'm giving up a piece of my equity on my flip profits to be able to hold something long-term. But I'm looking at this thing going 15 years down the line, I'm going to have a substantial amount of equity, and I'm looking at the return on investment on the money that I would have made after taxes, right? Because when you flip it, you got to pay the tax on that money, right? So, 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 so maybe you're looking at multifamily, or you might you might be looking at multifamily, multifamily versus single family. You may be looking at in California versus out of state. Well, this might be the the way of thinking about it, right? If you've got fifty thousand dollars, right, you may want to start off investing in out of state real estate because you have enough money and capital to buy that. That might be the best move for you. And maybe your, your need is cash flow. You're looking for cash flow. You're trying to generate cash flow because ultimately you want that cash flow either to live off of or maybe to replace the salary that you have. Versus if you have $600,000 in the bank, you've got a great full-time job. And what you're trying to do is earn a higher rate of return on that money than what you're currently investing either in the market or sitting in the bank. Maybe investing in California makes sense, right? You're not going to make as much money in cash flow, right? But you may not need cash flow right now. But 10 years from now, you may make all kinds of money on the appreciation. And oh, by the way, the tax benefits you can earn over that 10 years may be substantial. None is right. None is wrong. The question is, is what's the best fit for you, right? And understanding what you're looking for, that's the best way of thinking about it. I was going to say the tax benefits are probably going to disappear with this new tax, you know, bond. Who well, knows? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and knows? so, so far. Not, not disappear, but be diminished. I think even the worst of what they're talking about, it's not an elimination of the benefits of, of home ownership or rental or, or, or property ownership, but they're definitely looking at diminishing some of the value. And, and they're also talking about home ownership versus rental property ownership and things like that as well. So that's a big difference. Big difference. You're running a business versus your home, you know, and, and that type of thing. So it just depends. And in that tax plan, you know, it's, it's interesting because there's going to be winners and losers in every category. And when you're looking at it, it's a math problem for each individual, you know, that, that's going through this. Some people, for example, are currently subject to alternative minimum tax. And so that's going to go away. But some people uh, that itemize deductions are going to get hurt from that because, you know, the, the increase in the standard deduction is not as, as, as good as all their itemized deductions that they were getting. So it, it, it's definitely going to be a hard thing. We'll see what comes through. It's hard to predict what's going to happen because who knows with these government entities what the heck is really going to happen. You know, like they're all, 
you know, how can we steal more of your money anyway? So, you know, <laughs> so, and, and, you know, coming back to the, the California versus out of state, there are some big benefits of investing in your own backyard here in California. It's easier to monitor your team members, your team members out of state. You better get some good ones because if they, if they're not good team members, then you're going to be hurting. You know, just like what Dave was saying when it comes to, you know, your operating partners, if you're investing with somebody, which includes property managers, it includes realtors, it includes every single team member. Rehabbers. So, yeah, rehabbers. Oh, my God. Oh, how man. much money you yeah, can lose all if about you had that. Yeah. bad rehabbers? Yeah, we're we're not going to give you guys too much hell because we got a lot of contractors in here. So. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but, but you guys know for sure, like, how bad some of the other outside contractors can be and how much, if you're not there monitoring it, like, we go through it. I have a rehab manager that manages all of my contractors as well and is a completely uh, paid by me uh, uh, completely outside of the, the a normal contractor that's monitoring them where we control 100% of the materials and that's not easy to do if you're doing one single family home we're doing so many a month that it makes it easier for us to control but that team member is huge and and monitoring those team members out of state makes it more difficult you have to have a system set up to do that but it can also be lucrative because like Dave was saying the cash flow can be much higher in those markets but like he's saying too there's not as much appreciation depending on the timing of the market and things like that I actually met one of your rehabbers your rehab manager today so Matt Matt invites me over to his house today Matt just finished renovating a house added on a bunch of square footage did a massive renovation <laughs> so he invites me over he's walking me through the house and he's talking about how we did this we pushed this out here we changed this here and I did this I did that and we kind of get through the whole house I'm like Matt this is beautiful and his wife Lynn says Matt the only thing I let him do is pick out the sofas <laughs> it's, called, so, it's called outsourcing it's called outsourcing <laughs> he married his rehab manager right it's brilliant but she was looking at him the whole time going I did all what are you talking this? about you did all of this I did all of this get back to work I even made her put in the Nest thermostat and everything I'm like here you do that that's your job <laughs> we're gonna work you know so I can't get my hands dirty right now you know so so what questions do you guys have on this topic any, any questions that comes up that is interesting how many investors are you guys seeing chase or invest for appreciation over cash flow I've just I've never really heard anyone endorse investing for appreciation yeah, I tell you who generally I'll say in my world, right? Because you know we deal in the South Bay; it's higher, higher end properties. Right. People that have more money, right, that don't need cash flow because they have higher paying jobs, yeah. generally are looking to put that money to work. Like buying a piece of property here that just breaks even for them is a win, right? Because they don't need the cash flow, but they know if they can and buy it right now, they may not be investing for current cash flow. But seven to eight years from now, when all of a sudden the rents have gone up, then they are going to start getting cash flow and they're building appreciation. So I'll say in general, people that have more money will be less concerned about cash flow because maybe they've already created that through businesses or jobs or other real estate investments. Um, people that are generally starting, cash flow, to Matt's point, you know, that, that's generally the, the dream that everyone wants is have enough regular cash flow coming in that it allows you to live your life how you want to versus how you have to. Um, and so generally people that are getting started are looking more for cash flow. And if you had to pick one versus the other, I think generally to get started, you should be looking at how to maximize your cash flow. And, and I think that's that's important too. You know, it's like once you get to a certain level then you in and, and cash flow, then you can start taking those those bets on appreciation in different ways and things like that. And it also comes down to your own comfort level too. Some people are just not you know, cut out for investing outside of their area. They have to be seeing it, and you have to kind of know that about yourself. You know what I mean? Well, so. the, the high end fix and flips that we do, the, the invest, the equity partners in that, most of the guys that we were dealing with, the guys that are, that, um, are startup, uh, they, they started up different companies and sold it, right? So those types of people are used to putting in an hour's worth of their time and getting a 10x, 20x return on their time, right? And when I was doing junkies, they are junkies. For them, it's not worth them spending any time to go make 10% on their money. It's just crazy. If they're not making 30%, 40%, they'll take their time and their dollars and go invest in another startup business. So for them, the way they like to invest in real estate is they like taking higher risk and they like higher returns, but they can afford that, right? So that's another big you know, d d determination in asking that question is what kind of risk tolerance do you have, right? Well, for you, what's, what's a victory? 10% may just feel like... 
big deal. That's boring. I mean, if I'm not making 20, 25% of my money, why even get involved in it? Which, which comes from an active investor mentality, right? And a lot of times when, you know, when they're making that kind of return, and I, and I make a lot of that kind of return as well when I'm doing my deals, but you're also looking at it, you have to look at it from a passive standpoint, like is 10% okay if you're not doing any work? Or do you, and, 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 and I need to be making 20% plus or something like that if I'm doing all the work involved, because I'm getting paid for my labor too, right? So, you know, in those types of situations, you do get paid for your labor. But if you're making 35%, you know, 25% plus for that labor, then sometimes it's worth to do it. It's like your wholesaling or fixing and flipping and things like that as well, you it, know? It's, it's great so, due diligence, right? It's not right. just looking at the return the money's going to make, it's like the return time. on the time. And if you're getting paid 10% and having to invest a bunch of time into a deal, mm -hmm. well, why would you go do that if you can right. go make 10% and not have to spend any time in a deal, right? You're going to make the same amount of money. You might as well save your money for where you might be able to make a larger return because you're investing all the time in there. So, again, lo looking at the return on your time is just as important as looking at the return on your equity. Who, who wants to learn more about multifamilies? Okay. So um, who here has invested in multifamilies before? Okay. What, what questions do you guys have on multifamily versus us viewing? What, what's in any particular? What, what about multifamily you're looking to learn about or hear, or hear about? You know what I'd like to know. We have we own several uh, single family right now, and we're looking to maybe find a way of leveraging those so we can get into multifamily. How, how would we go about? What kind of options are there? Okay. So I think, you know, when, when you're talking about the different strategies there, you're talking about looking at how much equity you have in those single families and can you do, can you sell them into a 1031 exchange into a multifamily where you can take that equity, um, resell those properties, not have to pay the capital gains on those properties, put it into a new property that creates more cash flow, right? The whole point is that is to trade up into more cash flow. Um, at, at, the sa at the same time, um, you, you, you also may not have to go sell them. You may be able to re-leverage those properties depending on your financial situation and what your, what, what, how much, how much uh, loans you can get on those from you know, banks and getting cheap debt on that. Sometimes it may make sense to just refinance them, pull the capital out, and reinvest in those multifamilies. Um, Which one of the things that you can look at is there are lenders out there that will do portfolio loans, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, typically on a single family house, you're going to read, you're going to, you know, pull money out of that one property. There are certain lenders out there that will that will lend against a portfolio of homes. So package up the homes together, give you one home based on the total equity amongst all the properties. Um, which will then allow you to pull that out, maybe make a down payment on buying a larger piece of property. Um, so that's definitely, you know, that, that's really what you're looking at doing, is either leveraging... I'm sorry. Go ahead. I looked at a couple of letters and uh, we own, we, we have our properties under a couple of different LLCs. Mm -hmm. That issue that a lot of people won't know. But then I hear that they will. So, again... So no, normally um, when, you're, when you're dealing with traditional lenders... They're only going to lend traditional and single family homes most of the time, unless they're private lenders or something like that that have private capital. Um, they're not going to go through and lend to um, LLCs. They'll have to lend to you first, and then you can transfer those assets to an LLC. Um, now, keep in mind, if an LLC that you transfer to is not 100% owned by you and you're the one on the loan, the bank then uh, can enact a due on sale clause and have the right to call that loan due. But usually, um, if you're transferring it to an entity or an LLC that you own 100% yourself, they're not usually going to have a problem with that because you're not transferring the beneficial interest of that property to someone else. You still technically own that. And at the same time, if you're trying to trade up into multi, you know, I personally don't really like buying multifamilies unless I'm going to add value to it, especially at this timing in the market, especially in California, you know, which is what interested me about the eight unit he was talking about was adding the value is how you get that built-in equity in a multifamily. And right now, buying something at top dollar here in California um, that doesn't have any built-in equity or built-in equity capabilities is an issue. And you guys in the construction industry, I wouldn't be doing anything but focusing on that aspect because, and focusing on if you're going to trade up some of your single families, what does that cash flow stream look like on the back end after you've renovated that property on the multifamily side? And is it far greater than your single families, which typically it can be, especially if you're adding the value. It's like you going through and doing a new construction loan, uh, depending on what you get the land at, you could be in it for 75% or 65% of the value of, of, the, of the actual property after you build it. Same thing goes with the multifamilies, but just on a much larger scale. And it comes with different 
different money sources then too. You can still use private lenders and things like that on the multifamily side to help you with the construction aspect, but the lending aspect is completely different when you're dealing with multifamilies versus single families. They will lend to the LLC in a multifamily situation all day long. They just won't lend to the single families won't because it's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac money that they're selling off in portfolio loans to you know to Wall Street, and so. When you're dealing with the commercial lending aspect of this, they usually want you know 25, 35% plus down, and that is dependent on the debt service coverage ratio, meaning your, your cash flow from your property needs to cover your, your um, debt payment by typically like 125%. Sometimes they get a little bit more aggressive, but most of the time I see 125, 135% um, as far as what your cash flow needs to cover of your debt. And so, um, so you're going to always be limited by that. But there are lenders out there that will go through and give you construction financing too on top of that where you can use your single family money to 1031 into that and then use that as your down payment and use your, your um, you know, commercial financing from a commercial lender as, um, uh, as, as your, um, you know, the bulk of the money, right? And so yeah, that's what's you, really cool. Yeah, you may be able to take – you may be able to leverage the individual assets in more short-term private money type of environments, buy the bigger asset – Add value to it, stabilize it, mm-hmm. refinance that, right, and then pay off all those other loans. Right. Um, what, one of the things I also, because I, I think uh, an interesting exercise, if you haven't done this, you probably have a good sense of what your cash on cash return is, correct? You spent this amount of money, you're making this amount of money, this is what your cash on cash return is. Have you done an analysis on what your cash on equity return is? So it's not just what the value of the cash that you put in the return is, which you really want to realize mm-hmm. is the equity that's in the deal. How much is it worth? How much equity have you created? And what's your return on that? Because maybe you put in $200,000 worth of cash, you're making twenty grand a year, you've got a nice 10% return. But maybe the equity in that is half a million dollars. Well, if you've got half a million dollars of equity and you're only making twenty grand. Well, now your cash on equity return is like yeah. 2%, 3%, right? And that's, that's huge because that shows you if you were to realize that equity after taxes, after sales commissions, if you took that cash and reinvested it into something else, how much more cash flow it will create. And so you're, everybody here, whenever they own any kind of property or, or, or investment, should be always looking at their opportunity cost of their current equity and analyzing it to say, how much do I own now and what is it worth and what do I get out of it if I sold it or, or refinanced it after taxes and can I reinvest that at a higher rate and make me more cash flow with the same level of risk also. That doesn't right. mean go leverage 95% right. because you're going to be able to go and get a higher return when the risk is higher. So you want to, especially at the timing of the market when you're looking at, you know, uh, adding more debt or something like that, you want to be very careful. Like, like I wouldn't go tell somebody to go and buy a property right now in California that's just going to be break even when, you know, if the market tanks, you may be, you know, if you go put, you know, a, a little, a, you know, 20% down or something like that, you might be okay or break even if it crashes like crazy or something, but you almost also might be negative cash flow where or, or close to it. And if rents drop, then, then you want to be able to make sure you're okay still. And so always analyze it and say, if rents drop by 10%, am I still okay? Am I still making enough cash flow to live off of or to support that investment without that extra risk? Yeah, like that same example I just gave, like if, if your equity position was 500, you had 200,000 in, it might be worth it. If your equity position is 300, right, and, you're only, and now your, your cash on cash return is 10%, your cash on equity return is 8%, well, it may not be worth the time and the risk to go through and sell everything and start over again and add value for that increase. Yeah. But at a certain point in time, all of a sudden, there's a substantial amount of, of return that you're leaving on the table, your opportunity cost, that warrants investing the time and taking on the risk to, to achieve that higher amount of and so And so you're, you, right now, your homework assignment is to go and evaluate every single single family that you own analyze it for that that extra equity that you get out, but you also include how much you're paying down the loan too because that's additional return on investment on your dollar. Again, not just the cash flow, but the pay down of the principal. So that's your total return on investment. And look at it from that equity position like that because that will really tell you, okay, is there anything that I can put my money into that's going to create more cash flow? Then it comes down to 
how do you find those other opportunities and how do you learn about those to to increase the the cash flow that you that you want to want to obtain and that's why i was saying do the value add type approach because then you get the built-in equity it gives you tons of extra uh, options to do that so find something that is rents haven't raised since 1980 and you can do rehab too and raise those rents you know Let's move on. Yeah. Uh, one more question and we'll move on. I just wanted to go back to um, one of the cons of the out-of-state is monitoring, being able to monitor your people. Mm-hmm. Um, and you had mentioned systematizing that. Mm-hmm. Any suggestions for that? Yes. So your job when you have property managers, okay, is to manage your property managers, Okay. Property managers, the way you manage them is like anything else in life. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, okay? So you constantly have to be in communication with your property managers. The way you want to do that is you want to have a regular communication with your property manager, okay? That might be weekly. Maybe when you're just getting started, like you're going through a rehab, you want to get a weekly update. Maybe after it stabilizes, you want to get... Uh, once a month where you're getting some kind of communication on that. And maybe after a while it becomes once a quarter. But what you want to make sure that you're doing is that when you have that conversation is you're understanding where the issues are, okay? You're documenting what they say they're going to do, when they're going to do it, and then making sure you're following up with them on what they said they were going to do, whether or not they did it. If you're not doing that and you're asking them to do things and no one's checking up on them to see if it's being done then eventually they're just not going to do it because they've got someone else that is holding them accountable. That's where their time's going to go. So the number one thing is when you're managing out-of-state property managers, stay in contact with them regularly and just make sure you hold them accountable. Um, and then also, I know, you know Matt does this really well, is get proof of what they've done, right? If they say they're going to put in a new water heater, Awesome. When you send me that invoice for payment, send me a picture of the new water heater that you put in. Now, it doesn't mean with, they still can't with, scam you. With the, with, if you can, with the serial number, with the date and all that kind of stuff. We've had people um, tell us they're putting new AC units in and they're all old, you know, and then, and they, and they, or they steal it from another property to go put it in our property. Hey, this one got stolen, but we got another one over here for you that's brand new. They right. charge you for a brand new one. And so what you can do in those cases, because this is just ways... People steal, right? Contractors or managers or any team member can steal from you. And so having an outside person, another team member, like an outside realtor that's outside of the situation or an outside contractor or inspector or something like that to go do a walkthrough on an annual basis to get your back to say, hey, you know what? This guy said he did this. It didn't sound right. Something's off here. Can you go check this out for me and just go go do it? I'll pay you 50 bucks. You know, It's worth your peace of mind to go and and be able to manage that that way. And, and it's important, too, because act, I'm not just with property management, but with notes, with, with multifamily, with syndications, with everything, active management of your, of your real estate portfolio as a whole is imperative to your success. You know, you could go get sold on something that's going to get a, you know, a syndication or something that they say that's going to make you 20% or 30% or 40%, and then it makes you five and you never check. And you're just making five, and you have no idea, and you're going and touting, oh, I'm making 20, I'm, I'm doing great, but you're getting killed, you know? So, I mean, these well, are the Well, you're not getting killed, well, but, they're, but they're performing under pro forma, right? right? So right. you need, well, why? Like, what happened? Is there a problem? Yeah. Did they miscalculate? Is there a change in the market? Um, you know, understand what's going on, and it's, you know, especially in, when you're dealing with, like, when you're dealing with your own particular property, that's a lot more active because things are happening on a more regular basis. When you have a syndication... What you may get is once a quarter, you're getting a quarterly report. Well, if you're not reading the quarterly report as an investor, right, and looking at it and maybe sending a couple of questions in via, you know, via email or if it's something really complicated and nuanced, you want to get get on the phone and have an explanation on that. Like if you're not paying attention to it, that's where all of a sudden things go off the rails. And especially when you don't pay attention for a really long time, problems can fester. Right. If you catch something early on, it may be a problem. It might be easier to it painful, but easier to fix if you do it right now. Versus if you just have your head down in the sand and then you don't find out for another two years about the problem, maybe that problem is no longer fixable, and now you've lost all your money. And and you know, 
a, a key warning sign to, to, to people not managing operations correctly and things like that is bad communication. So if people stop communicating with you, people stop uh, answering questions timely and things like that where you got to ask four or five times in a row for something like that, that's, there's a warning sign there that something's wrong. Something's, they're not, if they're doing that with you, that means they may be doing that with all of their other team members and all their operation partners that are supposed to be running their, their business. So that kind of thing is important. So you had, you had a question here? Yeah, and wouldn't want to tell you guys up on this because uh, no you guys definitely hit it on the head. You mentioned, uh, you know, measuring out cash on cash to cash on equity. Um, I find it very interesting that you also mentioned the amount of time that, you know, some of these deals take, especially on the commercial side. Mm -hmm. So is there any multiplier you guys use to kind of figure out, you know, whether or not this investment is going to be a good investment in a timely manner mm -hmm. compared to what the cash on cash and the cash on equity mm -hmm. would look like? So I'll tell you this, right? The, 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 the thing that you're comparing it against is you, right? right? Because, for example, I have a lot of uh, elderly clients that have owned multifamily apartments for a long time. They used to love it. Now they hate it, right? right? So they've changed. Love those guys. They they've changed, right? So now what they want to do is, is sell the, the, the multifamily unit in Venice because they're tired of dealing with stoners for tenants. <laughs> and they now want to take that money and invest it in something syndicated because they don't want to deal with that anymore. Right. So really, it's, it's the return on your time. It's more about maybe something that you had an appetite for before you no longer do now. That's usually the bigger determining factor. But you, you need to know, all of us here should know what your hourly rate is, right? right? Every, all of us make so much money a year, and we invest so much time per week or per month into making that money. Having a good understanding of what your rate is, and if your rate is 50 bucks an hour, and this thing requires you to, to do whatever you're doing, and your return on that's going to be 10 bucks an hour, that's a poor use of your time. Unless, unless you're investing and you're learning. Like maybe you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're willing to invest that time right. because it's a great way to learn. But that's usually a good indicator that you could use is your time. A, what, what do you have patience for right now? And B, what else could you be doing and is there a better use for your time? And, 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 and another strategy to use for that specifically is when you're evaluating – you know, an investment for how much time you have to put into it for the return on your money. Right. You're all also going to look at it and say, okay, well, you know, I think I, for me, I've tried to convince my brother that my, my hourly rate should be a thousand an hour, but he doesn't believe me. Right, so, right. but you know, I'm like, this is what my potential is, you know? So, but no, in, in reality, like if you're looking at it from that standpoint, um, it's like, okay, if I'm making this amount of money, but it's costing me this amount of time, can I pay somebody else a cheaper rate to actually do that? And then how much am I making after I pay them for that time for, for being hands off? Is it above 10%, which, you know, maybe your threshold for doing nothing, right, as right. far as a passive investment. So you want to look at that for yourself Got as it. well, you know? All right. So in the interest of time, let, let's because yeah. uh, we're not going to get to all of these, but I think uh, there's a lot of questions on fixing and flipping, especially the lending side of it. I think it's worth talking about. Yeah. And then also we had some specific questions on the self-directed IRAs, which I think might uh -huh. be worth it. And then maybe the... You know, which the capital market. raising so, aspect is perfect for the fix and flipping right. aspect too, and the kind of the legal the structuring aspect of it will probably help with the fixing and flipping too. So let's talk That's about that. So, so you know, Matt and I both do different kinds of fixing and flipping, right? Like, you know, I do high high end stuff. Matt's doing smaller lower stuff, but Matt's also doing volume. Right? So what that means for him is that he needs to build a system that's way more complicated than mine because he's constantly churning through not just the acquisition, the renovation, and then the resale and the lease up of these properties. Right, So he's doing a far more complicated system versus we were doing like one or two houses a year, right? but they were, they were bigger deals. For the structure that, that we were using is that we were actually creating an LLC per deal we were raising money for the equity and then getting debt for the majority of the purchase. So, for example, one of the last projects that we did, we bought the house for 1.8 million, and it was a hundred. Sorry, it was a it was a one million dollar renovation. Now, it started off as an eight hundred thousand dollar renovation, but twenty percent on an eight hundred thousand dollar renovation is an extra two hundred thousand dollars, right? So, we were all in for you know basically a little under three million dollars. Well, what we did is we actually formed an LLC. We had equity partners that came in that, you know, because our we had to raise about eight hundred thousand dollars worth of equity, and we were able to borrow the other two point two million. Um, so that's how we structured it. How did you how did you find that deal? We found that deal through a realtor on the MLS, right? And and actually, 
the uh, we got the deal because, and, and it wasn't me, it was another realtor that brought us the deal. We made an offer on the deal, and the seller rejected our offer and had a higher price. So we bought it for $1.85 uh, million. They had it. They had another buyer who bought it for one point nine five million. So clearly, they went with their deal. What was the ARV? The ARV. Yeah, well, it, w- when it was all fixed up, it was probably worth about four to four and a half million. Wow. Right. Uh, it was an older house, I mean, great putting, views. How much you put it? Like a million af- bucks. After or well, million bucks after we thought eight hundred thousand yeah. dollars, but it ended up being a million dollars. It took a year to do the renovation on it, right? So they he went on his way. He bought his replacement property up in the Central Valley, and then three weeks uh, into escrow, all of a sudden, the buyer decided they didn't want to buy the property. So he came back to us and said, hey, good news. The property's back <laughs> for $1.995 million, It's all yours. And we said, no. And our offer still stands, right? Well, now he's got a week until he closes. He's kind of jammed up. He ended up having to take our offer, right? So sometimes being in backup position on a deal is a fantastic place to be. Because when that first deal falls out, their hair is on fire. They need someone to buy it right now. You know, I, so many people are all, oh, I'm so, God, we missed another one, right? The second you get outbid and you realize it, just see if you can get in backup. Mm-hmm. Yeah. doesn't hurt. doesn't cost you anything. And when it comes back to you, all of a sudden, they may be a lot more flexible on their price uh, mm-hmm. when they come back around. Um, so, yeah, so that's the way we, we structure our deals. You know, the debt got paid off based on a rate. We were paying like 10% on our money with a couple of points. That got paid off when we sold it. The equity, we had an equity share position, right? So all the equity partners had a split with us. We were considered the, the operators, and we got paid a certain percentage of the equity. And then the investors uh, got the other share of that spread out pro rata based on how much they invested into the deal. And I think that's important to understand, too. He's using a combination of debt and equity to get a position like that so he doesn't have to give up so much of the deal by using all equity. And by using a good chunk of equity on a higher risk type deal like that, it's it's a better play sometimes than, than to try to go through and do it all with debt where it's all on your shoulders and your money is in, at, at play, too. And so, you know, in certain situations, different structures work completely, you know, work to your advantage. Like I did a, um, I did a 30 unit deal that we have under contract to sell right now. And, um, it took about two years to renovate. We slowly renovated all the units and, and raised the, raised the value. I raised all debt for that initially, a hundred percent debt from private clients. And then I went through and I was in the refinance process and I didn't want to go put down $350,000, So I brought in an equity partner for that afterwards and put the money down and gave him 50% of the deal for doing that. And so like there's different strategies you can use on my single family homes in the very beginning when I was learning and, and getting started, I would use all JV money. I would joint venture with people that have the capital and split profits with them. But I, I put enough buffers in place to where my investor is protected, where I never have to go back to them for more money because the first time on a JV deal, you have to go back to a client for money. You lose that client forever. You lose that capital source. And so so you buffer your numbers consistently. You realize whenever you're borrowing money from private clients or using joint venture money and equity from private clients that this is their life. They've traded their their, their lives for this on a daily basis and earn this money the hard way. So if you lose their money, you're taking away hours of their life for that. So realize before you start raising private money with a debt or equity, learn how you protect them. Learn how the paperwork works. Learn how to structure the deal so that they're protected. Learn how to do it with performance-based incentives involves. But I, I was doing a lot of the joint ventures in the beginning, but now that I have all this experience and we're going through and flipping, I don't use anything but debt. Why would I go pay somebody 50% of the profits when I can borrow the money at 8% flat and be done? You know, there's different strategies like that once you get to a certain level of expertise that you just don't need the money anymore. But, you know, I also did a, a, a building where it was a 19 unit building that I bought for 149 grand in Tennessee that needed $650,000 of rehab. And I was just explaining this, I forget, I think I was mentioning it to you. And, you know, now we're in it for 900000 We use bank financing. I used about $350,000, $400,000 of other private money to do the deal. And, um, and it was a big risk to me because that's $650,000 rehab. That's a big, big rehab on a 19-unit building, which, you know, you guys are probably like, that's not that much money. It's 19 <laughs> units, you know, but we're not in California. We're in Memphis. So, you know, so the, 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 the materials are the same. The labor's cheaper, you know. But in reality, you know, I was a little nervous of that deal, so I brought in two equity partners instead of being bringing debt. But now 
we're in it for nine. That thing is worth 1.735. I'm kicking myself going, dang, I should have just borrowed the money at 8%. But it's a big risk. I learned a ton on that deal. You know, doing a, doing a major rehab on 19 units like that, you learn a ton. I learned learned my lessons on contractors. I should have I, I should have really stuck to the penalties that I put in the contract, but I, I was a little leeway because, you know, um, I'm talking to the contractor, and these are the types of things you learn. I'm talking to the contractor, and he's asking me how I get a bond and how I do an audit for a bond on a big commercial deal. And I'm like, well, you have to have your books straight. You have to be had an audited financial statements for this, and you have to know where your money is. And so I said, how do you know where your money is now? And he goes, well, if there's money in the bank, then I'm doing okay. And I'm going, oh, no, you are not controlling a dime of my money yeah. for sure. Yeah. You know. And so like, we controlled 100% of the materials. We controlled his labor percentages. We paid directly all his subs because we know now that if – if he wouldn't have paid his subs, they could go put a lien on my property, and then we have problems. So we got lien waivers. We put contracts in place. I mean, there's a lot of little things on a big job that you got to put in place like that that I could have been bit really hard, and one of my JV partners was an attorney. So he was like, I've worked on these really, really large 300, 400-unit deals on the construction side and knew everything about it and taught me a ton and just – happen to work really well. But these are the different things, the different structures you can do. On a fix and flip, you might use you know, debt for part of it and use the equity for the down payment piece that the capital partner won't, the debt partner won't put up for you and give them a percentage of the deal, but not maybe 50%, but maybe just a percent. So there's tons of different ways to structure these things. On the big deals, you want to talk about the syndication type stuff, how to structure those, or, or do you want to stick with the fix and flips? Well, I, actually, the, I, I think it's the just capital raising. It's so. just capital raising. I mean, really, you can syndicate a a big fix and flip deal, you can syndicate a loan, you can syndicate all different types of things. Generally what happens in a syndication is that you're bringing people's money together um, and you're paying them a set, you're paying, them. a lot of times when you do a syndication, there'll be what's called a preferred return. Okay, so let's say for example, we're going to um, syndicate a bunch of money and we're going to go buy a, a, a commercial building, right? Maybe we're going to go buy a retail center that has a, a Vons as an anchor tenant. Okay, so we're going to raise that money, right? That money's going to come mm-hmm. in. Um, there are there are legal um, uh, forms which the attorney over here, if you've got a question on the different ways you can syndicate and the different types of entities you need to create, talk to an attorney, right? You, that you that it starts everything starts with understanding um, the legal structure. And Matt mentioned about making sure that legally you're protecting your, the the risk of your investor. Equally important is you're protecting yourself. Right, because if you're not protected, why would you take on all this additional liability and expose yourself to a bunch of risk that you know you wouldn't have to do if you just maybe bought a different kind of structure? Um, and generally, with the way those those syndicate, once you've got them structured, you're generally going to pay out the investors. A lot of times, there'll be a preferred return. You'll hear that term a lot. Most preferred returns are somewhere in the six to eight percent range. Okay, so um, there'll be um, there'll be a loan that you get. Right, and you're paying that loan percentage at whatever it is. Then you'll have the leftover money is the equity. Generally, when it's a preferred return, that means your syndication partner, whoever your investor was, they'll get paid the first six to eight percent, whatever the the pref is first. And then every dollar above and beyond that, generally you'll split that with the investor and with yourself. And some deals there'll be a low pref, but then there'll be a higher split on the back end. Right, so maybe the investor gets all they, they they're only guaranteed like maybe the first five or six percent, mm-hmm. but once you hit that threshold, then the money might be split 50-50, or maybe it's seventy thirty or something like that, where they're um, you're gonna get a higher rate of return. But maybe you're gonna pay them a higher pref, but then the split on the back end is gonna be a little skinnier where maybe the investor is gonna make or the, the operator is gonna make a little higher split than the actual investor will. Um, so generally, that's how syndications are are structured. Um, there, there's a lot more legal risk when you do that, right? Because the second you start bringing in private investors that are passive, right, you start taking on a massive amount of liability, and you need to make sure that the legal structure that you're doing is both protecting yourself as the person creating and leading the entity, as well as protecting the investor, making sure that you know their position is is a, is one that you know they are as protected as they can. Mostly, what you need to do is make sure that the people that are lending you money, a have enough money to invest in that kind of deal. Right? You, we generally deal with people that are called accredited investors, which means you've got a higher net worth, you've got more. 
uh, disposable income to invest in these kinds of deals. You don't want people that don't have the financial wherewithal to lose that money and have it be a substantial impact on their lifestyle. Um, and then secondarily, you know, besides them being uh, accredited, you want to make sure that they have enough knowledge to invest in that kind of deal. Because if you're taking people and, and having them invest in something and they don't understand it and then something goes wrong, then they complain that you never should have allowed me to invest in this. I didn't know what I was doing. You now have a problem, right? And, so and keep, got keep in mind, away. keep in mind too, when you guys, when you're raising capital, you have to be careful about, <laughs> about, about securities laws. You, you absolutely have to be careful about that. So if you're anytime you're pooling investors' money together at all, um, where they don't have management control and you're controlling everything, you have a security. You have an issue there. Even when you're you're borrowing private money or lending private money, you can have a securities issue that you have to get uh, legal advice from. So when it, whatever structure you plan on trying to raise capital through, you just get an attorney's advice to make sure that you're doing it correctly and someone that understands the securities laws. You don't go to an eviction attorney to go get that securities law I I advice, right? So um, you know, and when you're when you're dealing with these things, um, like I mentioned. You don't have a right to raise the money unless you can explain to your investors exactly how the paperwork works and how they're how they are protected every step of the way. So, and and you know, like just to give you an example, um, I just lent out a two hundred twenty five thousand dollar loan um, at twelve percent a point, right? Uh, and I borrowed one hundred and seventy five of it at eight percent, kept my fifty thousand dollars in the deal. But I used a um, I used what, what happens is I have a promissory note to my investor that I lent the money to, that I, to for, for my flipper, to, and, and then and I have a deed of trust secured against that property so that they're protected. I have a personal guarantee. I have an assignment of rents and leases, which means that they can't just collect rents and not pay me. There's a, I'm, I'm an additional insured on the insurance policy. Uh, I have title insurance in place, lender's title insurance. There's a number of different things that I've done to protect myself. I did all the homework on that deal and know everything about that property to make sure. And I'm only lending at 70% of the market value of that, of that property, so I'm very protected. Is that, so is that on the carryback? Um, no. So what I'm doing is I lent the money, and then what I did is I borrowed the funds from one of my private investors at 8% and have a promissory note with my private investor over here, and then gave them assignment of my deed of trust to give them my actual collateral interest. So I have 50000 left in the deal, but I'm making 35% of my money because I'm only paying 8% on the other side, but that's because I did all this work involved, right? That we're talking about active work involved. And so, um, so looking at different structures like that where I'm giving them my assignment of deed of trust to protect their interest and making sure that they have the right legal counsel and the right, like, right, right person reviewing their financial situation, and I took a ton of time to educate that lender to make sure that that lender that's lending me the money fully understands everything uh, involved in the situation. So, you know, and, and made sure also that that 175000 was not all of their money, was not even a big chunk of their money. I want to make sure that, you know, um, they understand the risks, like what would happen if they don't pay me? Then, then what if my, my borrower doesn't pay me? Then it means I got to go foreclose on that property. And my personality is I'm going to keep paying my investor no matter what. I don't care if I'm bleeding right now um, every month to make sure I get that deal done because I'm going to go foreclose on the property and I'm going to go and resell it for a profit and then get all my money back plus my investor's money. Now, that would be an, like I have to know how to foreclose. I have to know what to do if there's a problem. So if you don't know what to do or you're not willing to take the action to solve a problem because you know, you're, I'm the one making a really high return on my money and controlling the deal, then I would have no business actually raising that money in the first place, right? So does that make sense? And so there's tons of new cool ways to structure things. It's just a matter of making sure you take the time to educate yourself so that you can educate your clients too. But so. by the way, I, I would think from a level of complexity, a syndication is by far the most complex yeah, thing you can do, right? Absolutely. The simple, easier way to do it is a joint venture or a partnership, yeah. right? So yeah. especially if you're looking at partnering with just one other person where maybe you have some defined roles. I'm going to do the work. You're going to supply the money. And maybe I'm going to put a little bit of money in. Um, looking through a joint venture structure is, is an easier way to get started 
bringing in one investor at a time and had an understanding the responsibilities. Matt talked a lot about communicating and communication. When you have investors, your number one job is not to execute the, the real estate, it's to communicate to your investor. Right? You gotta make sure that you're communicating what's happening. Whether you're doing well or whether you're struggling, whatever it is, you need to explain to your investor what's going on. That's the, a responsibility you have as an operator. So if you're looking to get started, don't think, oh, that's great. I'm going to go syndicate and raise a bunch of money. It might be too complicated to get started. Maybe you're finding one investor who has capital and you're just going to joint venture with them or create a partnership with them. Which one of those makes the most sense? Go ask an attorney. Get their advice. And, and, I, and I really like the joint venture structure for the newer investor on something like that. And it's not just a joint venture where – you're putting the deal together and you have a money source. You might want to do a joint venture if you don't have the experience with someone that has a ton more experience. I know a lot of people that all they do is they bring that experience to the table and they have other outside capital sources that come to the table as well. So then that way you're doing a three-way joint venture on something like that where you know you have an operations partner that knows all their stuff on that side. You have you that found the deal in the first place and then you have the money source as well. You know, So you have all these different opportunities to do this and if you're new and are not sure what to do or you're just nervous about raising you know, out here $500,000 plus dollars uh, you know, for a deal, then bring in that outside person that knows what they're doing. They can say, no, you're going to make a mistake. And if you have a good private lender that knows what they're doing, that um, they're going to go tell you, don't do that deal. You're going to lose money on this deal. And they won't loan you the money because in reality, you're, you know, they're, you're not going to be a long-term client anyways. So why would, they, why would they waste their time on vetting you, doing all this work for one deal? Most private lenders want to do over and over and over again. So they want to save your butt if you're doing something wrong. There are definitely some people that are just like, yeah, I'll charge you 20%, whatever, and hopefully I'll steal the deal from you later. You know, so watch out for those guys. Get referrals from even your capital sources. I've fired people that, uh, that have, have brought me capital before or, or lent me money before because they're crazy. And they, they don't have enough they, they don't have enough knowledge base to really understand what they're getting into. And I'm like, nope, that's the last deal you ever I had somebody yelling at me for getting their money paid off to them. After they signed the trustee release to take it off of the property, they wanted to keep their money invested and they were freaking out. And I'm like, this is not how this works. I'm never gonna borrow money from you again. It was only like fifty thousand bucks, but at the same time I'm like yeah, you're done. I might have had a different ex different example if you had like a million dollars or something. But I would have taken the time to educate him more, you know. But these are the types of things you got to watch out for. So does that make sense, guys? Does anybody have any more capital raising questions or anything like that? I know we just overwhelmed the hell out of you guys, so I'm sorry. So <laughs> but let's let's bring up one more because I, I know yeah. it's getting close here. So cool. we, we talked about using self directed IRAs and, and, and some um, some aspects of that. Um, you know what. First of all, anyone, everyone, anyone here um, not understand what a self-directed IRA is or, or what that means? Okay, so basically retirement accounts, 401ks and IRAs, generally you invest those things into traditional kinds of investments, generally things that are traded, right? So stocks, bonds, cash, mutual funds, things like that. By law, retirement funds can own hard-deeded assets like real estate, um, you can certainly make loans. You can you can write notes. You can even buy into businesses. You can buy into partnerships. You can do all kinds of things. But there's some restrictions on what you can do with that with those funds. Number one is you can't deal with people who the IRS consider prohibited parties. Okay, the number one person is yourself, right? So you can't self deal. That means that you can't go buy a house with your IRA and live in it, right? Because now you're actively taking. Um, so you're getting benefit from owning that piece of property, even if you use it as an Airbnb, right? Maybe you want to buy a house up in Big Bear, rent it out all the time, but use it a couple weeks a month. That's a prohibited transaction because you're using it. You're taking active use of that property. So it has to be something that's purely for investment purposes. Um, you can't deal with your immediate family, um, like your parents, your grandparents, your children, your grand grandchildren. You couldn't own a rental property near, near your son's college and then have your son live in it because he's a prohibited party to you, right? So therefore, it's a prohibited transaction. Um, there's all kinds of other prohibited transactions. But lineal descendants, right? Basically. Lineal like descendants. Parents, yeah. kids, you can't do business with. Brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, all that kind of stuff is fine as long as they're not really closely held business partners where there could be a present benefit involved. So, right. right. Um, and so... 
you can own real estate, right? You have to be careful that you're not how you operate that. Um, the question that you had was about you, you're you trying to fix and flip, and you've heard that you can't fix and flip through through a retirement. Is that correct? Right. Because I've heard that they have to be passive investments. Because I'm invested in a couple of syndications, mm -hmm. so that's passive. I mm -hmm. just give them my money and they do it. Now that I want to get involved in, um, in rehabbing, uh, I understand that it's more of a business and not a passive investment. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't be able to do it directly. But my question is, if I formed a limited partnership with uh, one or two other people, right. and I'm part of a limited partnership... Can I then invest from the self-driving that I run in the limited partnership that Right. So, so, so look, 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 let me answer the first question. The first question is, can you invest in a flip? You can. Okay? You, can. you absolutely can. Okay? Now, what may happen is that based on what you're doing, you can still do it legally, but what you may lose is some of your tax-free advantages. So if the IRS looks at what you're doing and says, look, this isn't just a passive investment. You're actually running a business and you're using this entity as the funding source. You can do it, but we're going to tax your profit. Okay, so that's really what happens. You can do it all day long. Now, what you can't do is you can't necessarily, like maybe you're a contractor, right? You couldn't say, oh, this is perfect. I'm going to buy this house with my IRA, do all the work, pay myself a fee from my IRA for my contracting thing and then turn around and resell it. Well, now you've done a prohibited transaction because now you've interacted with your IRA. You're taking present benefit. But as long as you're, you buy a property, you hire a contractor, um, you maybe you have, um, you know, they have a team that comes in, you're picking out the materials, you're turning around and reselling it, you can do that all day long. There's nothing and, illegal with that. And certain, certain CPAs um, will tell you that mm -hmm. you can't do it at all without it being um, a business, so it's called unrelated business income tax inside of your IRA. Well, again, um, you can do but, it, but you well, get yeah, taxed on it. Meaning, meaning you can't do it without it being a business, without being considered a business under the IRA or, or IRS regulations. However, other CPAs have taken other stances where, you know, sometimes you, they say that you can do up to four a year inside your IRA. As long as you're passive on that side and not actively running that business, then you can do the flip. So it, it, there's, there's different case studies and things like that on this. You have to specifically talk with a CPA that specializes in, in that aspect of things. But it, it, it's, it's very much, a, it, it depends if you will be taxed as a business. It's still legal, but... But there might be a tax associated with the income associated with that the investment profit. if you're deemed running a business inside your IRA. It's just like inside of your IRA, if you borrow money inside of your own IRA, like if you want to go do that flip and you have $100,000 of your money and want to borrow another you know, another 100000 then 50% of the profits of that deal, because you borrowed 50% of it, might be taxed as an un, uh, unrelated debt financed income tax. But what's cool is that inside of a solo 401k, you don't have that debt financed income tax. Uh, in an IRA, you do whenever you borrow money inside of your IRA or when your IRA borrows the money, not you. Um, but if you have a 401k or a solo 401k or a, um, or a, a Roth solo 401k, you can borrow pretty much all the money you want and you won't be taxed. Um, a, a, you won't have that debt financed income tax. So. Which, which is a complicated nuance to right. all of that. But, but um, and, and one second, Jeff, I'll, I'll let you, because I know this is your world for sure. <laughs> the other part that I want to, I know, I know you're like, oh, God, I want to talk about this. Um, the other part about this, the second part of your question is, can you use the LLC to help escape and maybe circumvent that that law? Well, yeah, the LLC partnership. It's, it will be a limited, like a joint venture LLC. It doesn't matter, right? So it, what, basically what the IRS is going to look at is like, just because you say, well, I can't do it here, but if I create this entity here, I might be able to do it over here. What the IRS is going to look, if you get audited, is they're going to look all the way back to your source of money. And if your IRA money is involved, no matter how it got into the deal, if it went into this entity or this entity, what Matt was talking about before, what they're really going to look at is you and your time. How are you operating? Okay. If you're operating this as a business, then they're going to want to tax it. If you're operating it more passively and you're just investing it and other people are doing the work and taking a more active role, 
It doesn't matter if you're using your IRA or you're creating another entity. If your IRA money's involved, they're ultimately going to look at you and how you're operating this. And if you're on your own doing all the work and you've got your subs and you're bringing people in, even if you just do one, the IRS may say, no, you can do it, but you're running a business. We're going to tax you. Like, yeah, in a situation like myself, when I have an active flip business where I'm doing tons every, every year and I do one flip inside my 401k, they could say that's a business completely because even if I have my other team members doing it because they can say, well, you're using your other business as a resource to basically do all this or I'm getting present benefit for my other business and doing that. It's, a lot of it can be you know, substance over form and things like that. So you want to you wanna make sure that you know, um, you're careful about you know, how it looks. Because you never know what kind of IRS auditor you're going to get, you know? Okay. So. I mean, the advantage of doing it through something that IRS is that it grows tax-free. In there. Correct. So if I come to be taxed anyway, then there's no benefit of doing it from. And, well, and it's, there, even, there, there, it's even worse, too. So uh, Not necessarily, right? Because it depends on what else you could do with the money. If what you're also doing with the money is maybe you're just investing it in, into a mutual fund that's returning 4%, right? Versus you're doing a fix and flip and you're making 20% even after paying the tax. Well, clearly you're doing better by investing in this investment versus investing in, in, uh, investing in this investment. What you need to understand is how much time's involved, right? And, and whether it's worth the amount of time you want to spend in it to make that whatever that incremental return is. Um, it may be that you could spend the same amount of time investing in something else and not have to deal with all this issue of taxation and UDFI and UBIT and all the things that Matt was talking about, and then which case you say, you know what, I know I could do it, it's just not worth it, I don't want to have to deal with all that, I want to do something simpler, mm -hmm. I'm just going to do more syndicated investments, I, I understand that. Yeah. Jeff, any feedback here? How'd we do, Jeff? Pretty good. Okay. <laughs> good. We'll take pretty good. Just one thing, this is a nuanced issue, but you talked about you know, the person borrowing money. The person is not borrowing the money. Yeah, the right. IRA or the solo K is borrowing the money. Mm -hmm. They're the entity acquiring the asset. They're the entity borrowing the money. Which, oh, by the way, your IRAs can borrow money. That's a that's a <laughs> nice advantage. You think that you can't. It may not be getting a 4% loan from Wells Fargo, but you can create leverage with your IRA. Right. And secondarily, where I would disagree with you on is it depends on when you're saying creating an LLC. You can create an LLC inside of an IRA and do investing. If you're talking about an LLC you own outside of the IRA, you cannot put your IRA money in it. She, she was talking you about tax. You're, you just that's a prohibited party. Absolutely true. And when, what she mentioned was taking her IRA and investing in a partnership with other people and other people. Well, you she could, talked about what I heard saying was creating an LLC. That, maybe I, understood, I think creating an LLC with her entity and then with other entities, you could absolutely do that. What Jeff's yeah, talking IRA about. Right, right, right. The IRA owns the entity. The IRA or owns a share of the entity. Right. It might only right, right. be a, a one-third. So you're talking about an LLC that's already owned outside or even gets created outside. Right. Completely. Because because now you're self-dealing. Now you're, now you're using now you're your IRA, IRA yeah. money and you're investing in something that you're actively involved in, and now that's a part of the transaction. And, and so in your case, when you're talking about a partnership-type situation like that or an LLC-type situation... Your IRA, not you, your IRA is the one that's being the partner or the shareholder in that LLC with those other people, not you involved in that situation. So it's the same thing as if you were to invest in a syndication. You're buying shares of an LLC in a syndication. You're buying a, a, a partnership interest uh, or a, a shares in an LLC when you're doing a flip with other people that are doing all the work involved. But it's your, Jeff is 100% right, just to clarify, it is your IRA that owns it. You and your IRA are completely separate parties. You have two you, separate EINs. Right, right. Like they're two separate legal structures. I mean, you have a social security number, but your IRA actually has an EIN. It's, it's, it's looked at differently in the eyes of the law. It's a whole completely separate entity. Um, I would have one third, I have three partners in. So why don't we why don't we save that just for the I think that's a great conversation to have with him because you've got and, and beyond just Jeff you may also have this may be a question where a consulting an attorney may also make a lot of sense as well because you're talking about your personal liability and whether or not what you want to do could cause some taxation or does that cause you some liability you should consult with an attorney on that and if you don't know one we'll recommend one to you that specializes in that. 
Um, based on time, because it's 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 nine, 9 11, 11. Why don't yeah. we why don't we kind of finish up on the um, the current market conditions? Yeah, and they, it feels like a good place to, to end it, and then we can go from there. Cool, sounds, sounds good. So, uh, who's scared of the market crash right now? You shouldn't be scared. You should be running towards it. Yeah, you should be going sweet. Let it crash. You make more money in a down market than an up market. Absolutely, in each like. When you have your barbers saying that they're flipping houses right now or trying to flip houses, you got you know we're at the top of the market and the margins are thinner. Right. When it, when when things are crashing, I remember buying a a ninety thousand dollar house for thirty thousand dollars that rents for a thousand dollars a month and just killing it because there's no cops because everything crashed. You know, I mean, there's some awesome opportunities when things crash, but things change. If you're right in the middle of a bunch of flips at that time you might have some issues, right? Especially in a market like California where it's really highly volatile, right? And so when you're dealing with that aspect, I think you need to be careful about your investments based on the timing that you think. We're in the 10th year of a seven-year cycle. So it, it, it's, it's due, but we, we have never seen this before. So, um, so we don't know when it's going to happen. You know, the underlying economics don't make a ton of sense right now. The, the unemployment is still high, even though they've fiddled with the numbers to make it look like it's, it's better than it is. You know, there's a lot of still th <laughs> things that have not improved from the, from the previous crash where we didn't really recover. As much as as much as they like to say we did, but you know, uh, there's there's opportunity that you need to keep your eyes open for. So in my eyes, when you're dealing with a, um, you know, when we're talking about market cycles and market fluctuations and things like that, you want to be looking at where's the opportunity, not what problems are going to exist and how am I going to deal with it and I'm scared. It's look at the opportunity and find the ways you're going to make more money than you've ever made in your life. And that mental switch is where you're really going to make the bulk of your money in a down cycle. It's also so. looking at risk, right? So yeah. certain types of investments right now. So I think we, we personally believe that we're at, at the top of the cycle. I'll also argue that I've been seeing erosion in this cycle for the last year and a half. Now, it's not across all segments, right? So, for example, we're no longer fixing, fixing and flipping properties in, in Beverly Hills, right? Because high-end spec redevelopment in the Hollywood Hills is usually one of the first things that starts to break down when the market starts to change. And from what we were doing it, we saw as we were buying that one property from when we sold it, we saw a dramatic difference in the amount of um, activity for people looking to buy that kind of property. So we started moving out. I'm a realtor in the South Bay. Manhattan Beach has been slowly eroding for the last year and a half, right? Two and a half million to four million dollar houses in the tree section used to sell in seven days. They're now sitting on the market for 30 to 45 days and the prices are starting to drop. Even in Redondo Beach where that price point is maybe in the high hundreds of thousands to low millions of dollars, that market is starting to change as well. So you don't always see a market that just drops. Generally, it starts to happen segment, segment by segment at a time. So part of what you need to do is looking at, you, you want to get a sense of the market as a whole, but you also have to have a good sense of the market that you're investing in. What does that market look like right now? I'm generally seeing that, the, you know, in general, it feels like the erosion is happening and that things are starting to, um, to fall apart. And like as Matt said, we're 10 years into a seven-year cycle. It's not a matter of if it's going to crash. It's just a matter of when it's going to crash. And the odds are it's going to crash sooner than later. So make sure that you're looking at positions that will somehow survive if the market crashes. Matt mentioned before about making sure you look at a deal and look at, okay, well, what if rents erode 10%? If I buy that right now at this price and rents were to erode 10%, what does that look like? And if you can't handle what that looks like, and if that happened, you would be financially distressed and lose the deal. It's a bad time to do that deal right now. And when you're when you're flipping on on a on a fix and flip, you want to be going and looking at it and saying, okay, if I believe the market could be slowing down, like in Manhattan or, or Redondo or something along those lines, and this is probably happening in different areas. This is your primary area, but if that's starting to happen or there's issues that you see on the horizon, when you're doing that fix and flip, can you still break even if the market value drops by 10%? What is your value going to be six months down the line? You know, is it going to crash like crazy? And it may not. It may be a slow, steady decline. And, and in reality, none of us are really going to know about it until a year later anyways, unless there's a major stock market correction or something like that to let everybody know about it, you know, and, and see what's happening. Can you hold it? Right? right. Like, right. What, what if all of a sudden the market crashes, the value drops, you can't sell it for a profit? 
but can you rent it? And if you rent it, what does that look like on a per, on a per month basis? If you're losing 1500 bucks a month to hold that property, to wait for the market to recover, then that might not be the right deal to do right now. But if you say, well, look, look at rents right now, worst case scenario, if I finish this whole project and turn around and resell it, I can at least rent it and break even and just hold on to it for a few more years before prices recover, then maybe it is worth taking a look at right now. Yeah, just looking at that downside risk. Right. right. On a commercial side, like, you know, from a commercial standpoint, looking at, right now, looking at class A completely performing kind of investments at the top of the market where everyone is is killing each other to buy that type of asset class at the top of the market is a really risky investment, right? So from a multifamily standpoint, buying a class A multifamily building right now that's that's stable might be really risky. But buying buying a class B or, or a class C type of building that has some value add where you can buy it fix it up, improve it, even if the market crashes, you may be able to create enough equity to offset the drop in market value, and that way you're somewhat insulated against a change in in market prices. Mm -hmm. Certain asset classes may do better. One of the things that we've been very bullish on is multifamily and self-storage. If there is a market crash, the the forces that... Mobile homes. Sorry, mobile homes. Sorry, multifamily. Mobile homes and self-storage. Generally, when the market crashes, there tends to be upward pressure on mobile homes because people can't afford to live in a house, but they don't want to go live in an apartment, so they go live in a mobile home. Maybe not in California, but like everything, you know, west of the, like east of the 15, right? Like all the way to to New York, everything in between here and like the Atlantic Ocean, like people live in mobile home parks, you know? Um, Self-storage is the same way, right? You may lose your stuff. You're going to live in an apartment, but you have all the stuff. So now you have to go put yourself in self-storage for a couple of years. It doesn't make those investments uh, resistant to, to it, but it might make them a little more resilient in case there is a change in market conditions. So I would say as an investor, just plan on right now there being a correction. We're not sure if it's going to happen this year or next year, but when you do your due diligence on a deal, think about, okay, if there's a recession, how is this going to be impacted? And then run your numbers on what it looks like with the 10, 15, 20% drop. And if it hits that number and everything blows up, then maybe it's not the right time to do that deal. But if it hits that number and it's like, okay, well, it's not returning as much as I thought, but I can sustain it, then maybe it is worth pulling the trigger on that. And, and that's the same thing with the multifamily aspect of this. When you're actually going through and doing a value add on a multifamily, you know, you may be trading at like a five cap right now, meaning if you sell it right now to someone else at a five cap, they're going to make 5% on their money, or maybe it's 4% or sometimes two in some of the class A stuff in LA and different areas, right? Where cap rates so, in Santa Monica right now? So five for sure. Yeah. So three so, and I mean, a half. So, two and a half. It's yeah. Crazy so, low cap. So and yeah. that's what's that's what's interesting is if you were to able to go through and do a value add to where hey you know what your uh, your cost you're in it for you're making seven percent on your money and then right now it's at five but if the market drops maybe then all that really means it's going to be trading at a higher cap rate meaning it's going to trade at a seven cap or I don't think it'll be seven but in California but maybe it's six. You just lose a little bit of your equity or at least your break even on the, the true value. And really you're looking at this from the long-term hold standpoint saying on multifamilies or some of these assets, no matter what happens, the whole game plan is no matter what happens, can you hold that long-term and still be okay? You know, I would say when you're in an ascending market and you're doing due diligence, what you're looking at is you, generally when you're in an ascending market, there are more sellers than there are buyers. So you get to be a little... Ch- Little, a little choosy, a little picky, and you're looking at this deal versus this deal, which one can I make the most money on, okay? When you're in a descending market, you're doing just the opposite, right? You're looking at a deal and you're saying, okay, which one causes the most amount of risk? Which one, if the market goes completely sideways, am I going to lose the most amount of money on? And that's the one you're, you're eliminating. It becomes about capital preservation when you're looking at a descending market. You have to be very, very careful that you're only taking risks on things where your downside is somewhat limited. If you've got an unlimited amount of downside in this kind of market, it's not a deal that you want to do. But you might be willing to take that risk if you're in an ascending market because the good thing about real estate is that time heals all wounds. And if the market is generally moving up, And even if you get caught up and it takes you a year longer to do what you're going to do, that may actually help you because prices went up, Mm. right? So you're like, okay, yeah, I kind of screwed that up. But look, if I'd have sold it a year ago, I would have made $50,000 less than what I can sell it for right now. 
But when you're in a descending market, that becomes you know exponentially more risky, and that's the type of stuff you want to avoid right now. Yeah, and you you, you basically go through, and you got to be careful because um, you know and look at that downside risk because those types of real estate losses and and problems tend to linger for a long period of time. It's not like it's easy to get out of sometimes, you know? So um, so you want to look at those downside risks, but there's still a substantial amount of opportunity to make money in this. And, and I can tell you, after making tons of mistakes myself, every time I made a big mistake like that, I grew leaps and bounds in my own education and my own ability to actually get out of those situations in the future and be able to make my money back and do tons more and add tons of resources to the table because I'm finding and fighting and trying to find a way out of it. And and in those situations, if you put your head down and do nothing, that's when you get deeper and deeper. If you're looking up saying, I need opportunity, these are the things that I need to look for, it's about mindset, not necessarily uh, about the, the issue that's that's facing. There's always a solution to those issues depending on the resources that you have available to you, and you can develop those resources more and more. When, when the market crashed, and I was telling you I was going to four networking events a week, it's because... I needed to raise capital very badly. That's the only way I could raise. Uh, that's the only way I could raise money is I was going to networking event after networking event, and I can tell you at every single one of them, I found at least one person that in the future, or if not right away, was going to be a, a private lender or a resource to me in one way, shape, or form. Because if you're going and meeting thirty people at an event every time, four days a week, every time, you're going to slowly be able to raise capital, and and it may take. The 10th time of seeing that person over and over again to where they're comfortable with you in the first place and understand your knowledge base and what you can do. But that is what it takes to get out there and grind and get through some of these problems. So uh, that being said, I think we're going to leave it there. Thanks a lot, Dave. That was awesome. I really appreciate your knowledge base on this stuff. And uh, that being said, um, feel free. Remember, next Thursday, we have our our all-chapter all, all holiday event here. And uh, Dave and I are actually going to be sending out um, – uh, some uh, some questionnaires in December uh, for all of our different Phoebe chapters to try to find ways to improve. If there's ways we can add more value to you guys or uh, ways that you, things you want to hear. If you want me to get a tan or Dave to lay off the spray tan, then you know, just let us know what's up and we'll go from there. But thank you guys very much for your time today. We appreciate it. I hope you have some good time networking. So.